Ms. 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 So good morning and sorry for uh, for the delay. So we start the, today's um, session. So the first presentation is by Virva Wittmann, Marika Patrik and Adele Vaks. Oh, ette vaks, ette vaks. <laughs> Yeah, please. Okay. Thank you, Anna. Um, good morning. Um, so this morning, um, I'm going to tell you about a toolkit that we've been developing um, together with Marika Patrik, who's in the Institute of Education at the University of Tartu, uh, and Adela Vax at the back of the room is also on the project um, for uh, for assessment of developmental language disorder among bilingual children or multilingual children, um, and we're um, we're not we haven't finished yet, so it's not about showing you the results. It's more about talking uh, about the process. Uh, so I will talk a little bit about the about the principles of bilingual language assessment, why this is a, an important topic and by the, the context in Estonia. And then uh, I'd like to tell you about the development of this toolkit called Kolake um, and the tasks themselves that are in the, in the toolkit. Uh, so because um, people in the room are coming at this from different, um, with different knowledge or, um, or dif different, um, uh, different backgrounds in terms of this topic. Um, I'll start very basically. So multilingual and monolingual language development is um, is not two completely different stories. There are similarities. There are um, the milestones that children hit are mostly the same. Um, they come in the same uh, order, but there are differences too. So there may be differences in um, in when children hit the milestones and there's much more variability. Um, and of course, uh, the most important uh, major difference across these two groups is that there's a very different amount of input that the children hear for if you're looking at just one of their languages. So if a child is awake for the same amount of time and has the same brain capacity, then um, inevitably, the, the input that they get in one of their languages, if, they're, if their context is multilingual, is going to be less than a monolingual child will get. Of course, there's variation within monolingual children as well in terms of how much input they get. So for, that's, this isn't going to be true for every comparison pair of monolingual and bilingual children, but on the whole, this is true. And a lot of emphasis is put on the quantity of the input, but the quantity is not the whole story. Another um, important aspect of the input to children is the quality of their input, which means how many different speakers they're getting input from, what kind of input they're getting, what sort of complexity, syntactic complexity, lexical diversity, and so on. So this should be borne in mind. This is not directly relevant here, but I want to emphasize, and I think it's important to emphasize when we're talking to teachers, speech and language practitioners, and so on, that the quality of the input is also important and needs to be considered when we're talking about um, assessing their language development. Um, in, earlier, um, in earlier times, but also to some extent today, um, there's this prevalent myth that bilingualism in and of itself is a risk. So, um, and this is seen, um, this is seen in how um, parents are spoken to. It's also seen in, um, in how children are treated sometimes in schools, in preschools and so on. And, um, and even today, sometimes parents who are deciding whether to place their child in, an Esto in a mostly Estonian medium school or a language immersion school or a Russian medium, uh, actually talking about preschools, um, they're given advice that um, that that this is the moment where you need to choose whether the child will be uh, both in terms of their linguistic abilities, but also in terms of their identity, whether they will be Estonian or Russian or something else. And this misses um, the whole complexity of possibilities of possible outcomes for a child with bilingual development. So, um, so research on child language acquisition. Um, like research in linguistics on the whole, 
is biased towards a small number of languages and especially Indo-European languages, especially one particular Indo-European language. Um, and it's biased towards monolingual children. So we have this sort of view of, it's much easier to look at the development of a monolingual child. It's easier to look at a monolingual, you know, to, to conceive of a grammar as a, as a nice neat whole, but that's unfortunately, unfortunately for researchers, not the not, not the truth or not the not the full picture in a in a majority of contexts. So, um, so this leads to also assessment instruments, um, uh, instruments assessing development in children, language development in children, um, also being biased towards monolingual populations. And this is a problem in in various ways. Bilingual children are more heterogeneous. Um, they have they come at language learning with a bigger variety of socio demographic background uh, factors. Their language exposure, if we're looking at one of their languages, their skills in one of their languages, their language exposure is different, a different length of time. It may have begun at different ages. Their input quantity and quality, as I mentioned, um, is different, differs across the group. And of course, their language skills at any particular moment. Um, are more varied than a typical monolingual um, uh, comparison group. So um, when it comes to assessment, this becomes an even more, uh, well, a, a more acute problem. Um, comparing bilingual development to a monolingual baseline um, is obviously not right or not, um, not very uh, instructive. Um, but what this means, if the assessment tools that speech and language practitioners and teachers have to, um, uh, to assess children um, are based on monolingual populations, is that they, in order to, and you know, speech and language practitioners know this, but it means they need to bring a much more complex set of skills and knowledge and experience to the assessment of bilingual children and intervention with bilingual children. Um, and this means that there's gonna be a lot of variation in how, um, how, how uh, equipped, how ready SLPs are going to be to, um, to deal with bilingual children. So um, when it comes to bilingual children's assessment, ideally we'd be able to assess the children in both of their language, uh, in both of their languages. Um, this isn't always possible, but where it is, conceivable that should be done and instruments should be normed not only on monolingual populations but on bi bilingual populations um, and that would be a huge step forward in um, in uh, effective assessment and then um, yeah so um, so when it comes to the by uh, the situation in Estonia which I think yesterday has been touched on in various um, ways. Um, there's an increase overall in bilingual children, um, in, in, yeah, in bi bilingual children or children with lang lang other language backgrounds entering Estonian language schools and preschools. Um, there's about 68,000 children in the preschools and about 4,000 in language immersion preschools, about 7,000 in Russian medium schools. There's a growth in um, or an increase in, uh, in Ukrainian speaking children in schools, but also there's just been a increase in the number of mother uh, mother tongue or you know what what people are reporting in the census for instance as their uh, native language and so the um the picture in terms of multilingualism in preschools is more uh, is more diverse as well as um as well as simply um larger numbers of bilingual children now for typically developing children these kids who either have a different language at home or come from bilingual backgrounds will, um, through the course of preschool, will um, more or less will catch up enough to their um, uh, monolingual peers, join them in first grade uh, when they're seven years old and they enter school and um, continue alongside their, their L1 speaking uh, Estonian peers. Um, and inclusive education, um, which is um, which underlies the the current educational system, aims to guarantee access to a meaningful, high quality education to all students, including those with native languages other than Estonian, at a school close to home and together with peers from the same age group. So, 
Um, so so the, the, the basic principle is that bilingual children and monolingual children should be studying together. Um, this, of course, um, uh, uh, should be the ideal learning context, language learning context for bilingual children. And it also means that children with, um, uh, with very, various sorts of impairment um, are, will be in, in the, in the um, group as well. Um, now, the law that's currently in preparation also designates bilingual students as students with special needs, which is bound to increase the workload of speech and language uh, pra practitioners. Um, and it also makes for an even more pressing need for tools that help uh, both teachers and spe speech and language therapists um, to make a distinction between children who are learning Estonian as an L2, um, who have difficulty or whose whose development isn't um, isn't as fast as expected, to make a distinction between those whose difficulties come from reduced input, a normal a sort of normal bilingualism situation. Some students, some some children are able to uh, compensate for that or catch up faster than others. And those whose uh, whose uh, slower developmental trajectory comes from an associated disorder, um, and that's an important distinction to make. The type of intervention that these types of these different types of children, these different types of bilinguals need, is different. So, developmental language disorder, or DLD, um, <clears throat> is is a term that describes children who are not acquiring language as expected in the absence of other bi biomedical conditions. So we're not talking about language uh, language delay that's associated with uh, autism or um, or other or other conditions. Um, and it's a long term systematic language delay, and it's shown to be associated with impaired language processing skills. So the tasks that are um, designed to assess children for DLD are, um, are particularly trying to target language processing rather than language knowledge. So they shouldn't be entirely dependent on vocabulary knowledge or syntactic knowledge, but rather tap into language processing. Um, and also this comes into what uh, ties into what I was saying earlier about, um, about the myth of bilingualism being a risk. Um, <clears throat> Parents of children with DLD who um, uh, are, are often told that they should um, leave one language aside in order to help the child focus on, on whatever language they need for success in school. And this isn't actually um, this isn't actually based advice. Um, so there are standardized tests for identifying DLD among children whose L1 is Estonian um, and that are in wide use in Estonia. But for bilinguals, as I said earlier, we need a complex assessment based on a combination of methods, some of which are subjective, um, and it's difficult to do this without tools, especially for uh, for SLPs without a, um, a lot of experience. And the assessment is problematic because partly because it's subjective and it depends on experience, but also because um, because uh, norms tend to be end up being misapplied. Okay, and um, and because the assessment is taking place typically in or often in the child's weaker language. If the child is acquiring, started acquiring Estonian when they entered the school system in Estonia, then, um, then that needs to be taken into account and you can't compare to a monolingual baseline. Um, and we've seen in a pilot study for one of the tasks that I'm about to tell you about, um, real but mis misdiagnosis in both directions. So overdiagnosis and underdiagnosis. We had a group of, uh, children who were uh, identified by the speech and language therapist at their preschool as DLD, who turned out to be half of the group turned out to not have DLD when they were tested in their home language. Um, they were at ceiling in their home language. So this just, I mean, for me, this is a, this screams uh, for the need for bilingual tools um, and for, um, and for, for, for better, new, more nuanced assessment of, um, of DLD. So we've designed, um, we're in the process of designing this test that we've called Kalake, which stands for which means bilingual children's language skills assessment instrument. But nicely, Kalake actually means fishy, um, fishy like little fish, not fishy as in suspicious. <laughs> Um, and um, and the Estonian Education and Youth Board, Harno, has um, funded this project for three years. So we're in the final year of the project, which 
means that we're scrambling to get a lot done in this year. Um, but um, but what we've done is we're not inventing these tests. We're uh, we're developing these tests based on what's been um, what's been developed within the Litmus network. Um, which grew out of a cost action uh, several years ago. Some of you may have been part of that. Um, and we're just adapting these tests to Estonian and then um, implementing them in a context which will be possible to share among, um, among speech and language therapists. So the important aims are that it can be easily administered in a preschool setting, doesn't rely on complex linguistic analysis, and that it's an appropriate level for typically developing bilingual children in order for it, for, uh, for it to be able to distinguish between, um, between DLD children. And it's composed of three tasks. It's an onward repetition task that... Um, I know it has been presented earlier in earlier years at this conference, I think maybe in the same room, um, the sentence repetition task um, and the cross-linguistic lexical task. So um, uh, yeah, and it's intended for children who are five to six years old. And it's um, because we're working with the Education and Youth Board, it's uh, being ma made available on the exam information system A's. Um, and all these three tests have been developed, piloted, modified, um, and right now we're in the process of norming the tests on a much larger sample where there are both monolingual and bilingual children um, and in both groups, both typical typical and um, typical development and DLD children. So the repetition tasks are the ones that are meant to tap into processing skills um, <clears throat> rather than relying entirely on uh, on language knowledge. And um, one of the things that's nice is that they've been developed specifically with bilingual children in mind. The other thing that's really nice is that they're available or that they've been developed and can be made available in a lot of different languages. And for us, what's especially important is that they're available in, in Russian. So the non-word repetition task um, uh, uses, so importantly, this really doesn't rely on uh, on vocabulary or language skills on the part of the children. Um, <clears throat> It, um, it, 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 it taps into what their skills are with phonological representation, phonological memory, and of course, articulatory skills. Um, and we're just using the language specific section, 36 words with these gradually revealed pictures, which is very motivating for the children. Um, and the children repeat these words that get um, longer and slightly more difficult as they go along. The sentence repetition task. Um, this is just the um, the visual. The visual part of it is a a bear who's going on a treasure hunt. Sentences are a little bit longer, a little bit more difficult, challenging, take a little bit more time. So um, so it's a little bit more rewarding. After every sentence, the bear advances and goes through different landscapes until it finally gets to the treasure. Um, there's two practice sentences, and then there's um, we started with sixty sentences um, and modified it down to thirty sentences, which represent 10 different language structures, among which are those which are cross-linguistically challenging, known to be cross-linguistically difficult for children, as well as those that are known to be specifically uh, challenging in Estonian. So since I, I don't have so much time, you can ask me about those specific questions later. Um, but this is based on last year's um, pilot test, a master's student who tested these. Um, you can see that the this is specifically the sentence repetition task it differentiates nicely between bilingual, typically developing and DLD children, as well as monolingual, typically developing and DLD children. But because of that, half the group that turned out not to be DLD, we had a very small group. Um, uh, and yeah, the the effects are the effects are um, more are are are, uh, are clearer with a larger group that we now have. Um, then the vocabulary test is a test of language knowledge. So putting this together with the repetition tasks um, gives us a fuller picture of the of the children's um, of the children's language skills. And the cross linguistic lexical tasks are based on um, work by Eva Haman and colleagues. Um, and the whole development of the task is it's actually a very interesting procedure. I don't have time to tell you all about it, but it involves um, uh, this large picture bank and uh, finding the words for which adults converge on a particular word so that it's it's clear, culturally, uh, culturally um, uh, appropriate and, um, and, uh, and works in that language. Then we ask about age of acquisition for, with a separate group of adults. And then we look at their linguistic properties before choosing the, the words that are in the final test. So we have nouns, 
verbs, comprehension test, and production test. Um, so these are four different tasks, each of which has 30, 30, 30 words in it. Um, yeah, and so uh, and so this is um, the results that we have so far um, is that um, indeed uh, the form of the tasks um, now distinguishes nicely within the bilingual group between DLD and TD typically developing and within the monolingual group between de uh, typical, typical development and DLD. And as you can see, there's a lot more variation in the bilingual group, but the tasks seem to work. So now we're um, in the process of a much larger norming study together with um, together with uh, uh, students and research assistants um, across Estonia and different um, and different preschools. And um, the hope is that by the end of this year, we'll be ready to train speech and language therapists and make it more available across Estonia. Thank you. Thank you very much. So many very few questions. Yes. Uh, about this new law. Uh, so if, uh, uh, did I understand right that uh, it will treat bilingual children as children with special needs, but will there be this division in the law between, uh, I mean, uh, what's going on, uh, what actual special need is, or do all those children uh, bilingual children, children with uh, I don't know, autism, children with, or they are just covered by this umbrella term, special needs, and that's it. So that's, I think, because it, it can be also like a discriminative term now, and uh, especially if treated by lay people and so on. I think I'm not going to comment on it because I don't know the specifics of the law and it hasn't, and it's, I think, still being, yeah, there, 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 may, there may be other people in the room who, who no. Oh, no, I have a different question. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. I, I I agree. There are issues. There are issues with yeah. this. But the, the the I think the 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 what I what I know is that as that um uh, bilingual children are now are, will now be categorized as having special needs, which is different from before, which places them in a different category. I don't know how much differentiation there is within special needs. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Please. Just a brief question. So uh, uh, for the picture naming tests, can you maybe uh, say the source? And another question is, does Estonian have, like, for instance, comprehension, like a Peabody adapted vocabulary test, comprehension tests, or maybe some communicative development inventories in terms of self-assessment? Like, what, what, are, what are the available? Yeah, there's a CDI in Estonia, um, but that's not, well, that's self-assessment, friends, sure. Yeah, that's uh, that's a different thing. It's not publicly available, um, and I'm not sure how. Yeah, but I mean, there, there. So there, there. That's been that. There are results from the CDI, but that's not a tool for um for uh teachers, um, and there's no Peabody um, picture assessment test, as far as I know. Um, and were you asking about the source of this? Yes. So if so, this is also developed within the litmus um network and Eva Haman in Warsaw um, is in is in charge. So all the picture the picture bank, for instance, is located in Warsaw. And she and her colleagues have published quite a lot on the development of this test in different languages and the results of the task, um, sort of looking at it from various um, various sides. But I can give you some references. Yeah. Well, thank you. I'm afraid uh, we have yeah. no time for more questions, but thank you. Thank you very much. Thank it's you. a really important topic. Yeah, I agree. Uh, our next speakers are Kapitolina Fyodorova and Natalia Chutkina. Well, this one can click. This one goes on. 
todos los cambios para no me quedan todos. Well, uh, in our presentation today, I would like to speak about multilingual practice and transliteration, actually mostly about transliteration in Russian-speaking Facebook groups. And I want to say that it's only the beginning of our research. We have gathered a lot of material and started to analyze it, but it's not finished yet. So the, there will be no specific uh, conclusions on the topic, but maybe a lot of questions which we ask, not only us, but maybe also you. And uh, to uh, to show some uh, specific questions uh, which are devoted to to this topic, we found out in one of our uh, communities su such an expression in in Estonian language where people uh, say about uh, the question how to transliterate even uh, the texts which are already in Latin script. But if you send a telegram during the Soviet times, you couldn't use this uh, Latin, uh, Latin uh, letters with uh, dots above it. And uh, that was the question, how to understand this word, the Cairo, but actually it's what Cairo, which means the, the stroller, the children's stroller. So the, the person who got this telegram in the Soviet times already had a lot of questions, how to understand what her sister wants to tell her with this telegram. <laughs> And uh, that's uh, that's the point of these uh, uh, questions of transliterations. And uh, here we also wanted to uh, note down that uh, online communication and uh, uh, it, it is very specific uh, part of our communication. And we have to think all the time about this transformation of our speech because it's it's not exactly written word, uh, form and it's not, of course, colloquial form. And it, it has a spe some specific features. And I just mentioned one uh, some of them. Uh, we use quite a lot of this text compression. You can see like uh, when we use numbers uh, to express some some words like for you, or uh, we just compress the text uh, uh, up to the word which we pronounce, not see chas, but chas, and it's very commonly uh, used in online communication, or how to use, how to show that this one is sh, можешь uh, перезвонить срочно. Uh, so we can see that uh, sh and ch just substituted with uh, uh, with the numbers which start with the same consonant in, in the Russian language. And of course, what is the other point that in online communication, there are a lot of reactions and we use a lot of multimodal means like, I don't know, memes, <laughs> memes pictures, uh, and so on. And the, the next point of uh, uh, of transformation of the speech is, of course, transliteration, which is exactly the topic of our presentation today. So uh, what is our data and why, why it's interesting because uh, that uh, we are working with uh, groups, Facebook groups of uh, which medium language is mostly Russian, and uh, this uh, specific type of communication where people uh, speak in minority. Uh, and we study groups in the Baltic countries: uh, Estonia, Latvia, and Lithuania. And uh, this specific type of communication, when people speak in a minority language, they at the same time uh, online they can. Um, use their mother tongue and communicate with other people in the same position from the same minority group, but people uh, they are not acquainted with, uh, people some strangers, and they can then, in this sense, they can uh, extend the circle of communication. And uh, even if they use majority language in their life, in most cases, uh, it's creates a possibility for them to use it to use online their mother tongue and um, these groups can be based uh, these online communities they can be based on different uh, different unifying factors locals you uh, naturally like uh, people from the same city or from the same part of the country or the same country but also there are some professional groups like groups of teachers of uh, Russian for example or some specific interests, some practices, and but languages, they also can be this unifying factor. And we have such groups as, for example, Russian Estonia, Russian speaking Estonia. So the uh, this ability to speak Russian is the base on which this group is formed, actually. And uh, by 
participate in this group, communicating in them and uh, sharing some uh, thoughts and news and uh, commenting them and so on. People at the same time maintain and uh, build this sense of belonging to these groups and they are these new emergent communities of uh, communities of practice they are developing in uh, online communication. Uh, and uh, specifically about the Baltic Russian speakers in online communication, uh, of course, they are not necessarily ethnic Russians, and uh, but they uh, constitute a significant part of population in the Baltic countries, uh, especially in Latvia and, and Estonia, and uh, they can communicate in Russia online, and uh, this uh, at the same time. Of course, uh, they the language the language they use Russian language is uh, somewhat different from the language used in by Russian speakers in Russia, and uh, uh, by communicating online, they also there is also a new niche, a new possibility to uh, further uh, develop these new uh, varieties, reg regional varieties, uh, and. Uh, uh create some new local norms and uh well uh of course as we all know especially now there will be more and more uh there are russian speakers uh educated in not in russian but in estonian or latvian or lithuanian and uh, it also means that literacy in uh, russian cannot any anymore be taken for granted because uh, well in some cases, people uh, people will will uh, only be able to speak in Russian, but not to write in Russian in Cyrillic letters, because uh, well, obviously, in uh, all majority languages in the Baltic countries I use alphabets based on Latin, but all these three alphabets are different because they use a different modification of Latin alphabet, and uh, when people uh, are not able uh to use to write in Cyrillic letters well quite often well maybe not that often for our liking to collect data but still quite often uh they uh use latin alphabet for messages in russian uh, sometimes just because they do not have a keyboard because sometimes because they just don't want to switch to uh, it's just easier for them and so on or some in some cases obviously because they are not sure actually how to use Cyrillic letters and so they uh, can rely on, uh, on transliterational rules, but those rules, although in all uh, three countries there are some certain rules of transliteration, obviously because uh, there is a need to transliterate geographical names, personal names, and so on. But in most cases, people are not very sure about those those rules, and uh, nobody before writing something uh, on the internet on their smartphone. Uh, some consults the you know official official guideline how to transliterate. So people just rely on their idea of how to do it. Well, uh, what's going on? Yes, yes and maybe a bit about this uh, challenges that do you remember our old telephones and if someone want, wanted to uh, use Cyrillic letters in the telephone, they first they had to go on to go through all the Latin letters and only after that they will, <laughs> will follow the Cyrillic letters. So it was easier and quicker to use just Latin letters. And that's quite a lot of people just got used to this system and they didn't switch to Cyrillics as well. And we know quite a lot of acquaintance. So as, uh, as for our groups, here you can see uh, the groups in uh, all three countries that we are following at the moment. And actually there are more groups from other countries, but if we speak about on the Baltic countries, and they are uh, organized maybe around the cities like Tallinn or Mairiga or uh, Russian Vilnius, or also they can be uh, actually belonging to the whole uh, to the whole territory of the country, or the, we, we can also see that we have Ukrainians in Tallinn, Estonia, or here Ukrainians in Estonia, and. Uh, there were Ukrainians in Riga, so they also uh, include people from uh, from the Ukraine and the communication in all these groups. We uh, we spoke about Russian speaking groups. They are mostly Russian speaking, but actually quite multilingual. Uh, as as for Ukrainian groups, of course we can meet a lot of Ukrainian language there, and 
also English and uh, local languages in all these three groups, Estonian and uh, Latvian and Lithuanian. So it's it's really multilingual. However, in the description of the groups, you can see that they are so-called Russian speaking groups. Uh, and and that's, that's the reality. Uh, and uh, that's the picture of different uh, uh, different groups in Estonia. As you see again, that's Ukrainians of Estonia, Copt, Italians, Ukrainians of Estonia, Stalin, Estonia, Russian Estonia. Actually, what about this group? A couple of years ago, the group changed the name. It used to be just Russian Estonia, but a couple of years ago, they changed into Russian speaking Estonian. So uh, it, it, it seems to us that it, it was a kind of discussion. Uh, why, why it is Russian. However, a lot of people of other nationalities just speak Russian, but they do not think that they are Russians. And so you, you can even see it in the history of the of the group. <laughs> and uh, next slide. Yes, here, uh, here are some examples of this transliteration, where, what we wanted to, to show you. And there are, there are quite a lot of questions how, for example, to, uh, to say you, Cyrillic you, it is usually I, 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 you, or uh, how to uh, <laughs> uh, how to uh, to express the sh, you see, and we can see sometimes s s h, but in this example we have a very interesting example which is in 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 Russian uh, this uh, discussing the the grammar grammar over the Estonian language. Now, as I start, as I start, would it tom случае pay attention that's ch, that tom случае если Uchinik, and that's again ch. In the one text, the one person uses different ways of transliterations. They say the same. And if we go on again, получил две двойки, как с кахте, с с любым числительным, начиная с двух. Yeah, 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 and and so on. And actually, the other point is also this u. Here we can see that u is like in Estonian. But in other examples, it was somewhere открывались. Uh, There's also u, which is expressed with just i. And and another one as aspect here, uh, we can also see how to show the uh, soft soft consonant in the Russian language. It's also uh, soft sign. Soft sign in the Russian language. Soft consonant, soft, soft sign in the Russian language. For example, here j is used na palapet. But here, the six is used. I don't know why. So it's, yeah. it's, 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 I think it's just graphic form. Because Maybe graphic it's, form of this. Uh, similar to six to... It, well. it, 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 it seems like this. And so, and the, again, this U as I. And uh, as for, for us, we just found out that quite a lot of this uh, transcription is not the same as, for example, we ha we would use in, in, in the same situation. <laughs> and it's not exactly the same that our, our legislation how we would use it. It depends on the rules of particular editing house. Because <laughs> <laughs> how they prescribe it to address serial patterns, but that's another another story. It's another total, story. total, total uh, craziness. Yes. And, uh, but also, oh. you, you can see that uh, this um, uh, the way to, um, to use uh, uh, this uh, vowels, vowels with Y in them, like U and Y, yeah, they could be with Y, A, and they could be uh, as uh, I, U. So again, that's... And, and another one. Mm -hmm. so, uh, mm -hmm. but new, new. Mm -hmm. what, what here we see, we see that actually we do not translate, we do not show how we pronounce the word. Mm -hmm. We show how we write it in the Russian language, because here, if 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 the person would follow the uh, pronunciation, there should be J O, mm -hmm. not J L, like yeah, like yeah. In, in the written yeah. language. Mm -hmm. So um, then uh, in Latvia, um, Latvian groups, uh, there are just some pictures, and uh, uh, as you can see, also there is a Ukrainian group, and. Uh, we can see that some uh, well so basically of course the problems are the problems people uh, um, the challenges uh, people have when they use uh, latin alphabet for um, writing in russian they obvious there are those sounds that are not uh, uh, normally represented uh, in a latin alphabet and of course for some in some cases for some uh, sounds there are in the alphabets of these local alphabets, 
uh, Latvian and Lithuanian and Estonian, there are already solutions. Like, uh, as we saw in Estonian, it was possible to use uh, this sh uh, for, for sh and for also for ch, t, t plus um, sh sign. But if, uh, like in Latvian, uh, such uh, letters are not used, uh, the only way uh, to to write ch would be this uh, convention from uh, English is uh, to ch. But uh, it could be also right with C. Hmm? This is what shows the material. Mm -hmm. yes. Latvian has uh, ch and sh. Yes. Okay. Uh, but they, they, they write it as C. Look. Uchilsa. With, uh, just with C. So, uh, and again, but again, uh, J, uh, J can be used uh, as a soft sign. And also, so uh, I don't know why, but uh, what we could find in Latvian groups, again, it's not finished, so we could probably find more. We can see that uh, there is a like a mixture, mixture of uh, uh, the sounds of Z and J as a result, because the same letter is used for that. Uh, but uh, here, for example, what uh, cannot be usually found in Estonian groups, uh, this uh, U and Ya are done with Y instead of J or I. So again, some uh, local specifics. And what again cannot be found in Estonian groups is the use of X for H. Uh, it can be found in Lithuanian and Latvian, but not in Estonian groups. And uh, yes, uh, again, svieže je, so that, that instead of, is that instead of ž. And um, uh, and uh, but also uh, again, I instead of for u, uh, and uh, mixture uh, some confusion between e and e is a result. And in uh, Lithuanian, uh, in Lithuanian uh, groups, well, Lithuanian alphabet also has a lot of different uh, different kinds of letters, and sometimes we can see even. I'm not sure, maybe it's not in this slide, uh, but we definitely found it when uh, instead of uh, with, when some vowels with like this with dots, a was used just as regular a and so on. But um, uh, here we can see that, for example, C is used for C, um, not, not for C like in Latvian, but for C here. But again, X is a substitution for H. And uh, also sometimes this, uh, some some different variation of uh, diacritics for different consonants and different um, di di different consonants and vowels, and um, for more or less regularly uh, for e, uh, y is used again as it would be expected in, for example, in English English transliteration. <coughs> Well, uh, what uh, can some preliminary conclusions that we can found? Uh, are of course, that there are these problematic sounds, problematic letters, uh, which we are focusing on. And uh, we can see that uh, also that there is a lot of variation, of course, and even high level of variation, even within uh, on an individual level, when the same individual can write uh, in the same sentence even uh, differently. But uh, there are also some tendencies uh, that uh, in different uh, in different groups in different countries uh, there are some like like no norm, norms in the making. People are relying on more or less uh, intuitively. Uh, clear for them some intu uh, intu intuitive rules. And uh, so these solutions are different in uh, different countries, depending on what language, what majority language in this country is. But at the same time, um, it's not always possible to distinguish between transliteration and transcription, uh, because in some cases we can see that it's exactly how the word is spelled, but sometimes it's how it's pronounced. And again, it can be because the person 
uh, cannot write in Russian, for example, or sometimes because uh, this person cannot write uh, well according to the rules. So uh, it can be a mistake. Uh, so uh, like when I is written instead of O and, and so on, but or uh, near together with the, um, the verb. But uh, in some cases, evidently, that it's just an attempt to uh, to uh, write the same as it's pronounced. And uh, uh, also, there is a blurring the differences between native and non-native language use, because also, of course, speakers of the majority languages, Estonians, Latvians, Lithuanians, they also tend to write in Russian, uh, but in Latin alphabet. And not always possible to distinguish, actually, uh, if it's a Russian speaker uh, transliterating or uh, Estonian, for example, speaker, speaker writing in Russian, but in Latin alphabet, obviously, because usually uh, doesn't have uh, uh, ability to, to write in, in um, civilic letters. And uh, just an idea, so there are tendencies, tendencies for some stabilization of norms, but of course, it's just based on this actual use, online use, and our idea, of course, would be to uh, continue this with, uh, well, make more quantitative analysis, but what that we, what that we need to uh, find the technical solutions because it's a nightmare to work with Facebook as, well, you know, if you ever try it. And uh, also would be maybe some experimental data because, uh, well, we are designing, maybe I will give this topic to some MA student because it would be nice to have some um, speakers, Russian speakers from different countries and just give them trans transformational uh, tasks and uh, see the results, compare the results, or how they would do, how would they transliterate uh, the same text. Well, hopefully that will <laughs> somehow work. Oh, that's, <laughs> that's just one very, very, very funny, funny meme uh, showing, well, uh, some... Uh, it's very... Very important in the English language what uh, so, uh, what uh, uh, vowel you vowel, use. Vowel you use, can use very nicely the text uh, which is yes. used. In, in, yes, the thing is that people transliterate differently, <laughs> but they understand each other <laughs> still. And of course, they also they are not uh, limited to their places. And some people from Estonia they participate in Latvian groups, for example, but they have no problem understanding what you meant. So well, transliteration is more about. <laughs> Convenience. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, so one <laughs> short question. We are. Yes. Yeah, sir. I want to stick to the schedule. Mm -hmm. Yes, please. So, there's so much interesting stuff in your data. Um, I'm wondering whether you've looked at all. I mean, I agree. It would be. It'll be interesting to look at your quantitative large scale um, uh, study or results. But have you looked at sort of the way this develops within a conversation? You know how much people pick up on and change their, mm -hmm. you know, adapt to each other and so on. Or recycle. Yeah, and recycle. <laughs> In the, today in the morning, I found one new example. Uh, unfortunately, we were uh, we had to upload our presentation uh, on Monday, <laughs> so I couldn't couldn't include it. Otherwise, I would include it definitely because it was uh, one message uh, written in Cyrillic, but twice the person switched to transliteration. And for me, it was obvious that it was like a quotation. It was quotation of his son. A quotation of his son. Way, because they were discussing some matter with the son, and his son was, uh, was his, he, his, he was from Estonian school, I understood. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and so, so the father was complaining about the, the son's, son's expressions and put no, this expression in something. And they were, so it, 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 it's also a way of uh, like uh, quoting the person. <laughs> person's non non non-perfect Russian, something like this. <laughs> so it can be also create with device. Well, I'm afraid we have yes. to stop here. Well, I have some ideas I can yes. share yes. with you later. So is the next... Uh, sorry, wrong language. So the next uh, speaker, yes, um, Elvira Kuhn is uh, our next speaker and she is on Zoom. Yeah. Yeah. Well, the slides are in English. She will speak Estonian, but the slides are in English. 
minum ini. Nah, bahan makan harus Miks ta mulle nüüd ei anna? Me tegime tegelikult proovi ka teisid päeval siin. Et... Kas te oskate midagi eelda selle kohta? Ma vaatan, kas ma annan praegu õigusi juurde. Proovi, kas sa nüüd saad jagada. Kohe? Ekraani. Ja. Saate jagada nüüd? Ma saan jagada küll, aga mul on... Oot, ma proovin selle valitäbiga. Mul tuleb ainult konverentsiprogrammi pärast ette. Ma ei saa aru. Nii üks hetk. Kohe ma teen selle ühe asja lahti siin. Ja siis võib olla... Võib olla ta tuleb ka. Nii. Share screen. Ja mis asja see nüüd siis on... Kas sa saad valita konkreetse rakenduse jagamise vahel ka? Minu on nüüd, et kui ma siin teisipäeval proovisin, siis oli share screen, alt tab ja kohe tulid ette need, millest ma siis valisin. Nii öelda, praegu ma näen ainult teid, see on whiteboard, iPhone ja konverentsi kava. Millegi pärast ei tule ette seda minu ettekannet. See ettekannet on muidu saadetud ka siis sinna rakenduslingvistika ühingu meilile. Aga teisipäeval kõik toimis. Ma võin jagada siit. See on see ERÜ. Ja ta on nagu sellise algusega ERÜ. Ja seda siin on juba need nimed on muudetud. Aga üks moment. Ma ei tea. Nüüd me näeme. Jah, ma jagan ise seda ekraani. Ma siis jagan vastu seda, et kas me teeme praegu niimoodi, et ma jagan meie kõigi jaoks siis seda esitada. Meil ei ole aega eriti. Jah, jah. See on lahenus, mis toimub kõesti. See on jah, õige. Et siin ma nüüd ei tea, kas te... Kas ma saan ise neid slaide siis vahetada või kuidas see... Ei, proovige, ei saa. Mina saan. Siis kamandage. Jah. Jah, siis ma lihtsalt teie siis vahetate, jah. Te meni. Jah, te meni. Tere kõigile, mina olen Elviira Küün ja siis piiritludes oma tänase ettekande teemat annan lühilevat Eesti romade keelest ja kultuurist, et me võime siis nüüd edasi minna siit järgmise slaidi peale. Kasutan selle rahvusrühma täistamiseks mustlaste ja romade nimetust vaheldumisi, sest eesti keeles kasutatakse neid rõõb nimetustena siis eesti keele instituudi järgi. Aga sellest räägin hiljem natuke pikemalt. Varasem nimetus romi jääb kasutusest praegu kõrvale ja pean siis rõhutama, et see on ülevaate uuring. Siin ei ole piirilist uuringut taga. Tuleb ka nentida, et romasid on Eestis suhteliselt vähe uuritud. Nii, siis järgmine slaid palun. Rahvaloonduste põhjal on romasid Eestis olnud alates aastas 1897-2021 alati vähem kui tuhat inimest. Rahvastiku registri andmetel elab Eestis 665 roma, ehk siis 0,05% Eesti rahvastikust. Need on siis ametlikud andmed ja 2021. aasta rahvaloonduse põhjal räägib Eestis elavalist romades 678, ehk neist siis 70% mustlas keel. Romade kõige suuremad kogukonnad on Harju ja Pärnumaal, Tartu ja Valgamaal ning Kida Virumaal. Nii, lähme edasi. Eestis elavad mustased jaotatakse kolme rühma, Eesti, Läti ja Vene mustased. Eesti romad seostuvad laiuse romadega, sest nad on ajaloolselt elanud laiuse vallas. Ning Vene romasid seotakse Narva ja selle lähipiirkonnaga, kuid üldiselt on tänapäeval hakkanud Eestis elanud Läti ja Vene romad, ent samuti Eesti romadena määratlema. Nii, aga vaatame siis järgmiselt slaidilt number viis, kuigi, kas siis ikkagi mustlane või roma, et kumba siis, kumba termimit peaks siis kasutama. Kuigi üldiselt on Eesti romad harjunud, et neid kutsutakse mustlasteks, soovitab Euroopa nõukogu, siiski rahvusvoolises suhtuses kasutada terminit roma. 
Samas kuna nimetusi mustased ja romad on kasutatud rööpselt ka Eestis tegutsevate mustas kogukonna kultuurihingute nimedes, siis võib eeldada, et kohalike mustas ei häiri ka nimetuse mustased kasutamine. Nagu eespool mainitud, siis ka Eesti keele instituut ei tauni nimetuse mustased kasutamist. Lisan taustainfoks juurde, et roma keel ehk mustas keel on suurimalt vähemuskeeli Euroopas ja seda keelt kõneleb umbes 3-4,6 miljonit romad täpselt arvo ei teata. Rahvas ja keel on oma nime saanud romakese sõna roma ehk kõikes inimesed järgi. Nii ja siis üks järgmine lühike slaidike, kuigi roma siit tuntakse rändava eluviisiga inimrühmana elavad nad praeguseks enamevad siiski paikselt. Vasakul pool olen foto on Mustas laagrist aastal 1919 ja paremal on kujutatud rõndavad Mustast. Nii, vaatame edasi Mustast emakeeled ja mitme keelsus. 2021. aasta rahvaloenduse järgi on suurem osa Mustast emakeeleks Mustas keel. Peaaegu võrdselt leidub meid, kes peavad oma emakeeleks Vene või Eesti keelt, siiski väike arv kogu hulgast ja Läti keelt nimetas emakeeleks vaid 12 isikut. Lisaks on romad üldjuhu mitmekeelsed, vallatakse nii oma rahvuskeelt, vene ja eesti keelt ning sageliga mõnda muud keelt, küllalt tihti läti, inglise ja soome keelt. Vaid väga väike osa eestis elavad romased ei oska võõrkeeli. Aga jah, kokkuvõttes on siis läti keel oskus meie romade seas üsa levinud. Nii, mida teame siis roma laste keele oskuse kohta? Roman Lutt on tuginedes oma uuringule esitanud andmed, mille järgi arvestavad romadest lapsevanemad oma laste keeleoskusele hinnangu andmisel vaid nende suulist keeletaset, kuna enamasti kirjutatakse vaid koolikeeles, see on siis vene või eesti keeles. Ilmeselt samas uuringus osalenud roma juutega lapsed oskavad roma keelt, väiksem osa valdav uuritud vanemate sõnul korraga nii roma, vene kui ka eesti keel. Ja kes on siis uurinud mustas keeli? Minevikus on seda teinud peamiselt Paul Ariste, kuigi enne teda kogusid mustas keele ainest ka Maasing ja Schulz. Ariste kogus keele näitid Läti ja Laiuse mustas murde kohta. Oma uunimist tulemused avaldas ta artiklitena nii Eestis kui ka välismaal. Lisaks on võimalik huvilistel tema tööga tutvuda ka Eesti rahvaluule arhiivi rahvaluule kogus. Kuid kahjuks on Ariste töö teise maailmas ajal osaliselt hävinud. Mida on teada Maasingu ja Schultzi kohta kui mustaskeele ainese kogujate kohta? Maasingu ja Schultzi kogutud mustaskeele ainest on kasutanud ka teised uurijad. Näiteks pärinevad Maasingu ja Schultzi ülestähendused ja keele näited laiuse romadelt, mida on kasutanud August Friedrich Pott ka oma samateemalistes uuringutes. Lisaks kõrvutas Mikloosih nende üles kirjutatud keele ainest oma uurimustes soome mustaste murde materjaliga. Ja edasi siis Teslev on koostanud Soome mustaste sõnaraamatu, kus on märkmaid ka liivima mustaste sõnavara kohta. Ja nüüd võime minna sealt siis jah võtse. Ja Maasingu ja Schultzi ülestähendusi kasutas ühtlasi Wolf oma liivima mustaste sõnastiku tarbeks. Natuke räägin ka keelemuutuste kohta mustas keeles. Nagu iga keel muutub aja jooksul, on maininud näiteks ka Paul Ariste, toetudes maasingu kogutud keelainesele, et mustas keele laiuse murre oli juba sajandeid tagasi eesti keele grammatikast ja leksikast mõjutatud. Näiteks võeti kasutusele mitmuse tunnus D ja laensõnu, näiteks sõnad 6, 7, see siis kirjutatakse Z-iga ja kahisa, ehk siis 6, 7, 8. Ja järgmisel saidil on siis Paul Ariste foto ka. Ja vaatame saad edasi ka kohe, et Eesti keele teada see Paul Ariste peamine uurimisobjekt oli küll vadjakeel, kui ta süvenes muulgas ka mustas keele uurimisse. Selle kohta on annud ülevaate Peeter Wacker. Ariste hakkas alates 1933. aastast kirja panema jutustusi kohaliket Läti romadelt kuni tutvus laiuse mustastega kogudes ka neid keelematerjali mulgas ka folkloori, nii et ta sai mitme külgselt materjali. Ja üsna pea avaldas ta artikli mustas sõnade kohta näiteks Manguma, originaalpildis Mangab, Paluma küsima, mis on mustas keele laensõna eesti keeles. Tegelikult on see peale eesti ja läti keele tuntud paljudes muudes Euroopa keeltes. 1940. aastal andis ta välja monograafia laiuse mustaste kohta. Ka paar kümend aastat hiljemuuris Ariste mustaskelt edasi täpsemalt Läti keelde üle kandunud sõnu. 
Nii, ja järgmisel slaidil siis on juttu ühest teosest proverbium. 71. aastal avaldas Ariste siis selle teose proverbium. Seal olid siis mustastelt kogutud vanasõnad ja 73. aastal siis ka mustas mõinas jutte oli ühtlas jabiks kogumiku Romeen ja Paramissi väljaandmisel. See oli siis Läti mustas murdes kirjutatud. Ja näide mustas vanasõna kohta, siin on siis originaalkeeleste näete slaidil, Ja eesti keeles kõlab see järgmiselt, hea on selline minija, kes sööb magedat toitu, aga ütleb, et see on soolane. Ja veelgi hiljem siis uuris ariste mustaskeele prosoodia vahendeid, kus ta kirjeldas näiteks seda, kuidas mustaskeelele üldiselt omased olnud pikad täishäälikud on säilinud tegelikult ajalud muretes. Ja 81. aastal oli mus aristelt saksakeelne artikkel, die darstelung su vaise ääni peat siiune liide, mõne mustasaulu esitus viis. Ja sellest mainitud artiklis selgus huvitav tõsiasi, et mustasaulu on võimalik esitada kahel viisil, seda absõltuvalt laulu esitaja soost. Nii, ja Paul Ariste mustaste raamatus 2012 siis leiab huvile nii tema artiklikku iga 38. aasta välja antud raamatromenge paramissi mustaste mõinasjutte. Need olid siis Ariste kogutud romakeelsed mõinasjutud ja nende eesti keelsed tõlked. Mida võiks siis öelda kokkuvõtteks Paul Ariste siis panuse kohta? nii Läti kui ka laiusle mustaskeele uurimisel võime öelda, et see on siis hindamatu. Näiteks keegi teine pole laiusle mustasmurret nii süvitsi uurinud, kui tegi seda ariste. Paul ariste uurimistööd mustaskeele ja murrete vallas on tunnustanud ka tema tööd ja retsendsendid. Nii, aga natuke paar sõna siis ka hilisemast mustaskeele ja kultuuri uurimisest. Uurimistöös naised Eesti mustaskogukondades on vaadeldud mustasnaiste positsiooni pere ja kogukonnas ning laiemalt Eestis. Oluline probleem, millele uurijad viitasid, talja tema kollegid, on kohatine ühiskonna diskrimineerimise tajumine, kuigi romade kogukonda kuuluvate risikutel on selles vallas üsna lahknevad kogemused. Mustaskultuur on Eesti suurnud Eeva Liisa Roht, kes kaitses 2011. aastal Tartu Ülikoos magisteri töö Eesti romade enese identifikatsiooni ja enese presentatsiooni kohta, ka tema käsitles oma uurimistöös muul kas vähemust õiguste ja laimalt inimõiguste teemat. Järgmine, kes on uurinud siis oma pakkalauluse tööraames mustasi ja nende keelt ja nii edasi, on Anette Ross. Tema kaitses siis 2013. aastal Tartu Ülikoolis pakkalauluse tööteemal Eesti romade mitmekeelsus, keeleoskus, keelekasutus ja keelekasutuse mõjutajad. Ta uuris Tallinnas ja Valgas elavatult romadelt nende keelevalikute kohta eri valdkondades näiteks kodus, tööl, sõpradega kasutatava keele või keelte ning meedia keele eelistuse kohta. Tema uuritud kuue keele ühi jaoks oli kodus enimeelistatud keel mustaskeel, laste ja vanemate ning vanavanemate vahel, kuigi koolijaaliste perede lapsed lähevad oma vahel suheldes sagel üle ka seisti või venekeelele, siin on näha kooli õppekeele mõju kindlasti ka, Väärtustavad romadest pereliikmed mustaskeelt ja püüavad seda aktiivselt kasutada, et keelioskus ei ununeks. Mõtugi see siis käib siis suulises vorbis ja ka oma kultuuri säilimist peeti oluliseks, seda siis leiti ka. Samas mainisid uuringus osalenud keeleühidet, nende tutvusringkonnas elava mõne mustaspere jaoks on kõigi pereliikmete vahel kasutusel kas vene või eesti keel, nii et alati ei ole see mustaskeel, vaid võib olla ka siis vene või eesti keel. Ja järgmisel saidil näeme siis, et sageli kasutavad romadest lapsed kahta ja isegi kolme keel tegelikult siis koduse keelena korraga. Vahel on mustaskeel kasutuse mitte mustastest külaliste juures olekul salakeelena ja väljas pool kodu on mitmekeesus üldiselt jätkuvalt tavapärane. Siiski kasutatakse siis mustaskeelt ka kirjalikusvormis ja seda siis eelkõige internetis suheldes. Nii, natuke siis ka romakeele variatiivsusest. Üldiselt on romakeeles palju variatiivsust ka ühe murdepiires. Isegi lugesin juurde, et ühe perekonna piires võib olla erinevusi. Näiteks kasutatakse vanemaid sõnu ja paraleelselt sama tähenduslike uuemaid laene. Näide hunt võib olla tähistatud vana indoaaria sõnaga ruv, läti laenuga vilkos, vene laenuga volkos või eesti laenuga untis. Samuti võib erineda hääldus. 
Nii ja siis mõnes riigis õpetatakse romakeel koolis vähemuskeelena või antakse romadele emakeelset õpetust. Näiteks siis Soomes ja Rootsis on roma lastel võimalik õppida romakeelt koolis emakeele tundides. Lisaks emakeele tundidele pakub Rootsiga võimalust õppida roma Rootsi kakskeelses koolis, kus pool õppetööst on romakeeles. Sellisel juhul on kirjakeel välja arendatud, on kokku lepitud ühises sõnavaras ja grammatikas ja aastast 2019 on siis võimalik Eesti romadel oma kultuuri õppida ka pühapäeva koolis, nii et alles hiljuti on see võimalus siis tekkinud. Ja seda siis tehakse Tallinna Roma kultuuri keskuses, mis on ka uus organisatsioon. Nii, Anette Ross on lisaks kaisnud Tallinna ülikoolis ka magistrid või mustaskeelte teemal. Täpsemalt on ta uurinud Eestis kõnedava roma keele lotfit ka murret. Ja selle kujunemist keelte kontakt situatsioonis. Lotfit ka murre on Lätis kõnelud roma keele murre, mille kõnelad on asunud Eestisse püsivalt elama ja nimetavad ennast Läti Lotfit ka või Eesti lalorit ka romadeks. Ja Nette Ross uurib roma keelt Helsingi ülikooli ülikoolis doktori õppes. Võibolla keegi teab, kas ta on juba oma töö kaitsnud. Mina seda praegu... Ei, kaugel selles ma oleks juhendaja. Selge, aitäh. Selge. No nii, vaatame ka järgmist sama ajal, nii, jah, oleme õiges kohas praegu. Samal ajal on romade kohta Eestis korraldatud ka rakendusuuringuid, kus põhitähelepanul asub sotsiaalsel küljel, mitte niivõrd keelel. Näiteks Eesti ühiskonda kuulumise tunnetamine ja palju muud. Näiteks Karabeskin ja Derman on siis aastal 2018 avaldanud uuringu või sootsioloogise uurimuse Eesti romade kuuluvust tunne osalemine ühiskonna elus. On olemas ka uuring noorte romade kohta, kus põhitähelevan on haridusel, tööturvõimalustel ja nii edasi. Selle pealgir oli Roma rahvusest noorte olukord Eesti vabariigis, haridus- ja töökeskond ja kus juures selle uuringu tellija oli siis Tallinna tehnika ülikord. Balti uuringute instituudil ühi uuring on ka olemas, mille pealgir on tausta info ülevaade romade olukorrast Eestis, on välja antud 2015. aastal, milles on põhusalt kajastatud Eestis elavate romade elanikkonna rühma suurust ja geograafilist paiknemist. Lisaks on sellest teav, et romade tööhõive ja hariduse kohta. Selle järgi õpib siis enamik romased Eesti õppekelega koolides ja on siis seal kirjas ka romade kodaniku ühiskonna kohta. Nii, organisatsioonidest, natuke lähemalt roma organisatsioonidest, kuigi kahe tuhandendate aastate alguses registreeriti mitu romade organisatsiooni, on siiski praeguseks neist suur osa oma tegevusel õpetanud. Näiteks tegutses Eestis aastatel 2000-2017 üllati pikka aega Põhja-Eesti romade ühing. Alates aastast 2012 töötab aktiivselt Euroopa romade foorum Eestis, mille eesmärk on kaasata romasid aktiivselt Eesti ühiskonda Ja 2013. aastal on ilmunud siis ka mahukas uurimise aruanne, siis on tõesti mahukas Eesti Roma elanikonna olukord ja lõimumise vajadus, mis valgustab gruppiinterjuude põhjal romade kultuuri ja nende igapäeva elu puuta või eri aspekte. Autoriks on siis Arak ja tema kolleegid. Ja siis seda aruanne, et soovitan lugeda neil, kellel on soov süüvida romade kultuurimaailma. Natukene siis ka lähemalt mustastantsu ansamblitest, vaatame seda, ja Eestis tegutseb mustastantsu ansambel Maljarka, mis loodi 2006. aastal ansambli koosseisu kuulub umbes 30 tantsijat, päris suur hulk ja koosseisus on ka neli lauljat. Tantsitakse vene mustastantse ja repertoari kuuluvad mustaskeelsed mustaslaulud. On olemas siis ka see, nagu ma mainisin juba see pühapäeva kool, seal on ka siis olemas juba oma selline, ütleme, ansambel. Nii, aga ükski organisatsioon pole oma tähtus, et romade jaoks võrreldav perega. Perekond on mustaste jaoks üks olulisemad institutsioone, olles nii stabiilisuse, ühtsuse kui ka sotsiaalse organiseerumise sünonüümiks. Ja perekonna olulisust on peetud lausa äärmuslikuks, toetudes nüüd kirjandusele. See on püsiv tunnus muutlikus maailmas, ette arvamatutes olukordades. Ja selline sotsiaalne solidaarsus pakub ka muidugi sotsiaalselt ja psüholoogilisest turvalisust. Kukkuvõtteks võib väita, et romade keelte kultuuri on Eesti konteksti suuritud viimasele ajal suhteliselt vähe. Siin võib muidugi vajelda, et siiski on uuritud. Alguses, kui ma alustasin seda ülevaate uuringu tegemist, siis oli mul tunne, et 
Võibolla seda on veel vähem uuritud, aga siiski ma leidsin, et ei olegi nii väga vähe uuritud. Siiski võiks öelda, et võib, võiks ka muidugi veel rohkem uurida, sest nad on ikkagi ajaloolised olnud Eesti üks rahvus vähemusi. Ja kuna uurmispõllul usun, et on veel küllalt ruumi, et see nii saaks täidetud, siis loodetavasti leidub uurijaid, kes jätkaks Paul Ariste ja ka teiste uurimistööd omade keele ja kultuuri kohta. Nii, siin on siis ka viite allika, et kirjas peaks olema neljal slaidil järjest, neljal slaidil järjest ja võite julgelt siit edasi liikuda ja siis lõpetuseks siis aitäh kuulemast. Aitäh! Aitäh! See ei praegu või Eesti keeles rääkida. See on someone who doesn't understand Estonia. Saavad aru, aga aitäh! Palun, palun! Aitäh kutsumast ja aitäh, et oled juba siit osaleda. Aga küsimusi võib küsida. Questions? Jah, palun. Kuna ettekandes varieerus kustas keel ja looma keele nimetus, siis ma tahaksin küsida, et kas selle rahva loenduse, kus aiti üles keel, mis on siis nüüd emakeel, Kas see rooma keel oli põlikus või see oli muu algus nimetati? Tegelikult seda ma isegi täpselt ei tea, aga ma arvan, et seal võis olla võibolla mingis, no ma võin spekuleerida, et seal võis olla mõlemad, võisid olla mõlemad variantid, aga võis olla ka mustlas keel, lihtsalt pandud mustlas keel. Aga täpselt ei tea, see oleks väga huvitav. Ma olin valik ja oli vist võimalus, et see ei kirjutav, sest siin on olnud saavutamalt. Ja just, et seal on olemas ka. Oli see lause isegi, et inimesed nimetasid olema keeleks murret. Kuna see oli kestsi võimalus. Seal võis ka varieeruda see, et mida kirjutati siis oma rahvuseks, aga tegelikult või oma selleks emakeeleks. Et tegelikult on jah, niimoodi, et siin on natukene ebatäppne see selles mõttes, et ka rahvaluendustel võiks olla see nii-öelda täpsem ikkagi, see, mida pakutakse valikuks. Ma arvan nii. Ma just mõtlesin seda, et kuidas keele kõnele ise oma keele kohta öeldab, et ma arvan, et võib olla see rahvaluendus, mis mõtlesin täpsem valikus. Ruugi olla. Mida on valikus juba aitab? No, siis ruugi olla. See ei käida. Aitäh! Me peame vist lõpetma. Suur tänu ja suhtleme veel väga tore, et te kasutasite ka Anette Rossi tööd. Jah. Ja minu juhendatav ikkagi. Jah, aitäh! Nii, et siis hea taega ja lõpetame. We finish now. So we have a small pause. Väike vaha ehk on nüüd. Et selle seksioon, see seksioon on sellega lõpkanud. Lingvist, that also has creative, artistic gifts. And she has drafted this... It's the same verb, armastama, to love. Um, and it is, oops, it is um, uh, a verb of, uh, that uh, occurs in partitive object construction that uh, Jelena also already mentioned. But, but what's specific with it, it's uh, that usually in Estonian or generally verbs can alternate, uh, alternate between nom nominative and um, uh, genitive and uh, partitive in object case marking but uh, in this case uh, partitive case is the only option so so uh, so here we see a bit uh, clearer picture uh, and when hovering the uh, cursor here over the uh, uh, grammar part so uh, the point is that uh, we can highlight parts of the construction uh, when we want to, to kind of see them, those in collocations or in examples. Uh, but it's also possible to, to 
work out something like that the uh, for the user that so he, the user can uh, only see parts of one part of the construction and we can highlight that uh, here you see we have this abstract description of the um, partitive object uh, construction added and uh, uh, what is uh, maybe most useful for a learner but also maybe a teacher to see what uh, what are other verbs occurring on th in this pattern so when clicking on uh, verb part in the abstract construction description you can get uh, hopefully a list of the uh, partitive object verbs uh, the question of constructing con constructing con entry we think uh, it should of course um, uh, the entry should uh, contain the type of uh, uh, construction and uh, also subtype and uh, then the difficult uh, question of name we have also already discovered the difficulty of naming uh, construction it's not easy and then we have to define the form uh syntactic and uh, morphological form and its meaning that may come from the gap slots uh, words that can uh, fill the slots and uh, productivity description language proficiency level frequency information and uh, a regular expression for corpus query so that's our preliminary uh, uh constructed con entry design and uh, now uh, taking now we we vision that uh, take the steps steps we have to make now towards the Estonian constructed con or we we need to start from organizing and unifying those government patterns collocational information and uh, also example sentences already provided in the combined dictionary and then we wish to add fully schematic constructions, semi-schematic constructions, uh, and also lexically specified constructions. And uh, theoretical work must go on with gathering existing constructional description of Estonian and uh, developing it further. And uh, another field is um, we need to develop our methods to identify constructions in the corpus. And also, it uh, involves lots of technical work enriching the combined dictionary with constructions and uh, also uh, methods to define and display l2 proficiency levels need to need consideration so we have lots of questions right now uh, like how to realize this network idea of the construction inheritance relations what are the limits of our data model and the database, and uh, what what will be our backbone, so-called backbone structure for the constructicon, the internal view and the display view for the end user. How to define those L2 proficiency levels? Uh, how to connect the constructicon to the corpus? And how should we find those novel and undescribed constructions? Uh, so the conclusion of the first vision would be that there is light at the end of the tunnel. Two minutes. We have two minutes uh, for questions. If you would, if you would like to ask or comments, yes. I can imagine for our lexicographers, it's a kind of scary because mm -hmm. we are going to restructure the whole, um, not the whole, but partly uh, how how we compiled it, how how dictionary is compiled at the moment. And it may be also a lot of uh, work for developers, RVs or data modeling. So it also takes a lot of energy and thinking how to restructure it all. But we hope it's doable. <laughs> It seems like no, probably not. Okay. Then, oh, yes. Oh yes. Yes, please. Thank you. Uh, very interesting. I have, I have lots of questions, but I can. But uh, 
regarding the integration of the construction entries and the lexicon entries, uh, the picture you showed there, the uh, construction was included in the lexical entry. But then you were talking about it as if they were separate entries. So how, how do you combine them? Do, do, you, do you envision a link from the lexical entry to the construction entry uh, and, and back? Or do you like want to incorporate the relevant constructional information in the lexical? I mean, you could do both. I'm yes. just wondering how, how you envision it. I, I, to show the user, I think it's very handy to look at it, uh, like uh, you want, you you'll first uh, take a look at the word, and then you have the possibility at least to yeah. find the constructions, the words, of course. So, so when you clicked at the verb, you got the list of all the other verbs contained in the same construction. So you were like bypassing the construction. Yeah, so we we our our vision is that um, our um, since it is a relational database now it, we have only word based search for users, but okay. we want to provide also construction based search for users. But it would be it would work like on the same principle. Okay, so so basically the verbs are what the Berkeley guys call the construction evoking elements, mm -hmm. in, in the sense that that's what you organize it around. Yes. Okay. That's that's what we would like to have, so that uh, user just uh, has uh, this our uh, uh, user interface. You know, this is called Synavib, and uh, but here, uh, oh, okay, but uh, so it's only word based now. But we want to have it broader. Yeah, no time anymore. So let's uh, let's proceed uh, for the next uh, paper, and uh, I'm very glad to call Bilans here, and now we will. Uh, jump into Hungarian uh, lexicon. On a synthetic Latin. You know, once a little on a presentation, sorry, but. Hello, everybody. I am Barney Josh from Hungary, from Budapest. Uh, I realized that I agree in very many aspects, also with Jan and also with the Alana and all group. So there will be repetitions in my talk, I think. But my approach is different. So I, I just emphasize my approach. Uh, let me begin with two quotes with a famous book. <laughs> One is, in the beginning was the bird. <laughs> maybe you can speak up a little bit, maybe just yeah. louder. Yeah, I'll try. <laughs> uh, later came the construction. So <laughs> we, we, in the old days, dictionaries were made, but now we create constructicons instead. <laughs> so inventories of words, inventories of constructions. I will use these abbreviations, which I learned from the Jamie's book. Can can we consider them yes. a standard? Yes. So CXN is the construction, CCN is the constructicon. The second one, show proper respect to everyone. So not just the four. To, to constructions, but also to works. The, sol the solution is, which is completely not new, uh, just everything is a construction. So every word and all things are construction. So if we build a constructicum, we will cover everything. As Benjamin exactly said, the dictionary is a subset of the constructicum. The constructicum is a superset of the dictionary. So my view is, which is different from the previous talks, constructicons are not some kind of supplements to dictionaries. Constructicons are replacements for dictionaries. So what we build covers all the constructions and covers all the things which is in the dictionary. 
So to put it, uh, this is one main message of my talk that uh, sum up this evangelization part with this picture. <laughs> do, you know this, do you know this name? Mm -hmm. So I am I'm coming from Hungary. This is my part of my talk. I'm very happy to be here in this workshop. We are also happy kind, that you are here. So <laughs> we are also kind, happy. Kind, kind people, inspiring mm -hmm. atmosphere. So I enjoy it. Uh, our project is the Hungarian Constructive Project, uh, lasting for four years from this January. Maybe you can uh, see this little logo. <clears throat> and I am coming from this institute. We are also already with the intro. I will I will show you two approaches, which from which the second was will be my approach, the ultimate lexical resource approach, with which you can imagine from the what I said. One slide about how a dictionary became. Is to to transform to a constructicon. Then we'll make a short demo. Then I will cover some aspects, some aspects uh, which in the core for papers for this workshop. And then I will give you a summary. So just just see the orange part. Uh, it is unrealistic. This is the creators of the Russian constructicon. Uh, it is unrealistic to expect to produce a comprehensive constructicon, so we try to do this. <laughs> the, they they say that they they only only will cover this uh, uh, constructions which has uh, open slot because other constructions are there in other resources. But we want to cover everything, so integrate everything into one ultimate lexical resource. Yes. My my favorite quote about this radical uh, approach is Hilbert's uh, formulation. Um, okay. I think that the, this is the right direction, but it's, it's, it's too much. This is a very promising direction uh, of lexicography to attempt to create this ultimate lexical resource, which includes everything. So I just repeat myself. So as the as everything is a construction, this ultimate resource will be the construction. In contrast with other initiatives, which start from learners' books or corpora or frame nets, sorry, not to mention, uh, we start from a monolingual dictionary and transform it to a construction, constructicon. Uh, this is a, a, a good approach because dictionaries also want to cover everything, cover the whole language. And because they are a subset of Constructicon, uh, this approach will be sound. This transformation is basically this. We lift out the multi-word expressions from the entries, create separate entry for every uh, uh, construction, and link them back to the original entry. Uh, I so. I can tell that the Hungarian concept project is a, some kind of theoretical, can, can be considered as an experiment whether our approach is working or not. Yes. And then the demo. Do you know the table for from Goldberg's 2006, this famous table, but now with Hungarian examples. I won't go into detail, but we can after the talk. Just two examples. So 
to explain to every, every single transaction, promote them to uh, complicated uh, expressions. I just take two, which is in bold space. So avocado is also avocado in the end, it's a simple word. And fu beharap, which is bite into grass, which means by the last. So die. Fu uh, is grass. This is a case marker into, and this is byte. Do we have Firefox? Mm -hmm. uh, or, I can't really recall. Uh, is, is Firefox necessary or will uh, Chrome. Chrome? The Firefox is there as well, but yeah. In the desktop. So I I will try to show you both in parallel. So on the left side will be the original dictionary, and on the right side will be the first version of the Hungarian constructicon. This is demo, and let's see. So. Sorry. Um, I I hope that it will work. It's too small. Is it good? Let's see. So the last one is a dictionary, so to be hard up. You don't get any sense. It's not a head word in the dictionary. We better up in the constructicon. It's a construction that means to die. Okay. And what happens if we try to query tube, which is into grass? It also doesn't have anything in the dictionary because it, it's a agglutinated word. <clears throat> but in the constructic, um, we will have it, it says that is a combination of two constructions, one word and one bound morpheme. So that's the that's the structural description of something like that. And you will get the entries also for the word and also for the agglutinative uh, ending, which is not ready yet, but it will be there. Okay, and if we just try fu, which is grass, and you will make the entry for grass, and you will get uh, more or less the same in the constructicon. You can see that these kind of sorry, these kind of traditional signs are right written out, and all the constructions are in green, and so Fubehara was uh, originally this, mm. but here it's only a link, and separated uh, entry. So do you get the ID? I hope. And the one one last thing, I forgot about avocado, but it's not, it's not interesting, you can try. Uh, 
what if we uh, write in a construction with uh, some uh, context? We didn't have anything from the dictionary. This is Okifi Baharapi, who buys the dust. Just. And what you will get, the construction is extracted from the input text, and the two parts, two constructions, one word, who, and the other is separate, is displayed to the user separately. Okay, that's the point. The now only the non-mutable uh, continuous constructions are uh, extracted from the input text, but the the main task is to uh, extend it to every kind of constructions. Okay. Not as much, but that was that was the, the main point, I think, this demo and the comparison to the dictionary. Oh, I, I will go so quickly. Um, I choose six extracts yeah, from the uh, for that's what I mean in the code for papers. Yeah. How to define a construction as broadly as possible, include everything. Uh, Should a construct encompass the most? Yes, of course, it should encompass everything. <laughs> uh, which construction should be included? The same. Uh, that's that's the you, you 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 can you can consider this wheel, so it's not ready. We will introduce. We will work out a general dependency based. Representation, which we hope will all constructions can fit in this uh, uh, model. So we we have co uh, filled concrete constructions from the dictionary, but many of them it's it's uh, it's clearly a difference. The Swedish and the other constructicons have. Uh, abstract semantic constructions and less of them. We we also will have this this semantic this schematic constructions, but uh, they are not uh, ready yet. And we we plan to to process also the examples from the dictionary because I think that they tend to be constructions, not uh, often. They are constructions, not not real random examples. Okay, third so one. I think we, we the, the representation should be for, fully formalized, uh, maybe accompanied with a human readable format somehow. So we target also NLP and language pedagogy and everything. Uh, it, it may be a, a bit too bold, but we will see in two or three years. Uh, I, just one point, the, the last last point. Uh, so the question is how, how to do relationships between constructions and other units. We won't have other units, so we will have only one kind of relation between construction. And uh, I, what what I think is important from the uh, one lexical resource point of point of view, we can cover every uh, relations. We don't have uh, inter-resource relations. All relationships are intra-resource, so within the same framework. And this, I, I think this is an important point, and we, we, that is why we do. Uh, how we do it. 
uh, yes, when when this uh, model will be worked out, then the dictionary will be transformed to to fit in the model, not the other way around. So we don't, we don't want to squeeze uh, constructions into the dictionary, but we will develop a model and put the dictionary inside. Okay. And the one, the last important point is, so we use analyte search as you see in the demo. So our interface is really just put in your text and the system will extract the constructions and show it them to you. And because of this, we don't have to have names, don't have to have an organization and how to browse the constructions because you just write in a text and you get the constructions. We, we, so we won't have a kind of browser which, which the Swedish construct Tikkan has in on the left side. Okay. You can try it and contact me and this is the summary of what I said. Thank you very much. Yes, thank you. Thank you. Okay, so we have questions. Yes, then please. Uh, thanks. I have lots of questions, but to, to start with the last Maybe one. you can come closer because this microphone uh, is no, here. No, the sorry. microphone is up here. Oh, okay. sorry. And here. Sorry, yeah. sorry, sorry. Uh, so first you said we don't need to worry about names and organization because you just enter an expression to get the construction. That would mean that you also have a construction of parser, so the from the expression, you can recognize what construction it is. Yes, and that's why I I wanted to ask you how how to do this in like this. Yeah, and uh, you are you are working such such a, a construction. Uh, the Brazilians are, are closer to that core than we are, and the guys doing fluid construction around as well. Yes, but it's, 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 there's a bit of work left to do there. Not easy. Yeah. Uh, then. I have a question about everything in the sense that if you derive the construction mm -hmm. from a dictionary, you can get all the constructions that are in the dictionary, even if they're collocations or used to examples or whatever. But if you buy everything in the language, then you yes. need to somehow right. get the constructions that are not in the dictionary in any way at all. Yes, yes, of course. I, I mean everything in the sense of this sense. Yeah, yeah, okay, okay, good. But yes, we start from a dictionary. Yeah. We don't uh, collect constructions from a corpus. No. We, 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 now, we take the dictionary granted and hope that it covers the language. It's not, not our part. Uh, and, and work with this data. Yeah, yeah. So we, we concentrate the formalism, the structures, and not the concrete data. And when, when we are ready with, with this, uh, then we can add more. Okay. Uh, Makes okay. perfect sense. Okay. Just okay. want to check what you mean by everything. Because the way you started out sounds like something that a former colleague at Gothenburg said that we're working towards the big database in heaven. <laughs> That's the starting point. It's a big data It's a nice goal. Just to yeah. get closer. Getting closer is surely good yeah. now. Yeah, I think this uh, one of the things which needs to be improved also is sense disambiguation. For example, if I have this, uh, let's say, uh, idiomatic or multi word expression. And then in this expression, I would have, let's say, the verb to be, which has something like 20 senses, and then user get all those 20 senses, and then uh, the user has to disambiguate himself or herself, right? So this is also one thing that uh, might be, you know, it needs to be solved, <laughs> let's say so. Uh, if, uh, if the input, yes. Yeah. Ma ma mainly, mainly we, we try to show everything which is possible. Yes, you show everything. So we, 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 mm -hmm. we do it, we do this automatically, so we won't try to. Yeah, right. So, 
This is next step. Next step. So <laughs> what what, uh, what uh, Benjamin do uh, manually with this per one? Mm -hmm. we, we won't do that. We even want Maybe. to go further because we don't want uh, we just uh, don't want to connect just on the level of um, lemma, right? We want to connect on the level of sense, and our database actually allows this. Uh, like so, but you still now at the moment you need to find this correct say, uh, sense manually. But still, we want to make it like sense using the data. Yes, but in in our approach, it would need a construction parser which can automatically determine the sense mm -hmm. but mm -hmm. it, it, it is it is not in the project proposal yes i yeah i know but uh, but uh, theoretically uh, with those llms and new approaches for yeah. automatic sense inductions and such maybe, kind of things maybe something maybe there is a uh, maybe that's a bad the the our parser may know that this fur is a conjunction Mm -hmm. So we can show only the conjunction this, senses. This, this would help already. It, yes. yes, this yes, would yes. help already, definitely. But it means that yes. we have discussed it also. It means that all your um, dictionary should be um, considered as a kind of corpora. You pass it. Uh, you have there like a, a part of speech tags, grammatization, morphological annotation, and so on. And then when user is looking for some... Um, uh, strings, let's say so, then you kind of disambiguate it on this level so that you really are able to consider what are the part of speech, what's lemma, what's morphology, syntactic uh, role, and so on. And yeah. if, if you if you just write in a word which is I hope that it will work. Mm -hmm. So it it has mm -hmm. okay. Sorry. Yes, and, and now sure. here yes. the user needs okay. really, you need to disambiguate, right? But if you would have um, uh, like possibilities to predict uh, or somehow what user might uh, search in the dictionary, then it would be more. Okay. Okay. Thank you but very much. now, uh, thank you very much. <laughs> Now I give uh, the floor to Daniela uh, from Croatia, and we are going to talk about uh, preposition, uh, preposition uh, database for creation and prepositional constructions. We have discussed it already a little bit. It's a very, very uh, serious problem for Estonian language as well. At least in our resource, this preposition uh, uh construction how to present it it's not so at all it's very really basic right yeah oh it's not really looking great <laughs> and the clicker it's working okay you can use the pointer as well if you need yeah yeah i, I like the pointer thank you yeah. uh you stand here the most people fall when they can see you okay mm -hmm. hey hello uh, today, I won't be talking about a constructive term per se, although I'll be happy to answer questions re related to another research group that I've been a part of that has been working on constructive terms and constructional approaches. But today, I will be giving a constructional perspective on a proposition database built for Croatian. Now, uh, this database is basically the main goal of a project that started on New Year's 2023. Uh, so this academic year called Croatian Prepositions in Use, Semantic and Syntactic Analysis. And this is really a work in progress. You can see that I don't even have photos of, of my collaborators here, but I have names in uh, future presentations. I promise to provide those as well. So uh, some of the main project goals or the main project goals are basically to build a database of prepositions. And to do that, you have to research their syntactic and semantic features. And through doing this, one of the goals is actually to research what, in a theory-neutral way, could be called complex constructions. I am going to call them constructions in the post-construction grammar sense, and build a repository of such constructions, and through that, study uh, the relationship of basic and figurative meanings in preposition semantics. That's one of the big topics concerning prepositions in languages of the world. And finally, to relate contemporary uh, research that we are doing with applied linguistic research, specifically in the domain of Croatian as a second foreign language, 
as uh, anyone working in such applied linguistic domains knows, prepositions or appositions are quite a challenge for students learning new languages. Now, why prepositions, you may ask? Why a database of this? This is not something I think globally you come across, <laughs> a database of prepositions. More commonly, it's verbs or something like that, right? Well, when you look at prepositions, they're function words, and they are an integral point of study for the continuum of lexicon, grammar, the, their interaction. And basically, I'm going to say something that's a spoiler for the last slide. My personal opinion doing prepositions, researching them for 10 years now, is that when you're describing function word semantics and syntax, you are describing constructions because they need context to function, right? So uh, from a syntactic point of view, when you look at prepositions, you get into questions such as verb valency, of course, or, or verb actionality, act and sat. Uh, but also argument structure constructions, noun modification. You get a lot of syntax um, you know, distributed, a lot of information that's important for, for the language system in general. On the semantic side, they have been a staple of cognitive linguistic policing studies for a long time now, since Claudia Brugman's um, 1981 seminal study of the preposition over as a policing network in English. Grammaticalization is tied to prepositions. How do we get them in languages? And finally, semantic role labeling is something that is intricately tied to prepositional phrases in languages of the world. Now, why Croatian prepositions? Well, in Croatian, as in other languages, they're a heterogeneous class. So this fading out effect is done on purpose. Although we can see view them as a closed class, you know, the lower part can be actually tied to conjunction functions and they're sort of open preposition expressions. The word class reinvents itself diachronically and synchronically all the time. And when you look at also the fading out effect and how much literature has given attention to which subtype of prepositions. And here you can see that the primary ones are morphologically simplex and the secondary ones complex, derivational, syntagmatic, something like that. Well, in Croatian, as well as other languages, as to my knowledge, you know, primary prepositions have received the most attention, uh, semantic, syntactic representation. Unfortunately, this presentation looked, looked a lot better when I sent it, something uh, is missing, but it will work, it will work. Lexicalization and grammaticalization. And finally, the question of their lexicographic uh, representation or inclusion when it comes to, you know, the sort of borderline examples. Now, um, why Croatian prepositions? Oh, wow, you have to listen to my voice. You know, I have a regular Microsoft Office. I don't know what's going on, but fine. Uh, why Croatian prepositions? Well, Croatian is a Slavic language. And as we all know, Slavic languages are rich, morphologically inflective and derivational morphology. And in grammars, actually Croatian grammars, uh, you have descriptions of preposition case construction for the basic unit, right? And in some way, I have to say, when you look at the philological tradition in Croatia, a case is king. So when you talk about the syntax and semantics of cases, usually you say, oh, genitive case has these and these meanings. With a preposition, it has such and such meanings. So we want to sort of shift the focus and start from the preposition onwards and not, you know, start with a case. And there are reasons for this. For instance, if you look at the three examples with the Croatian preposition in, you get the locative, accusative, and genitive case. And, you know, respectively, you have sort of the location meaning, the goal meaning, and finally, the possessive construction. And when you look at something like this in our database of 240 prepositions, you actually see that, you know, there is one case that goes well with them. Uh, it's the genitive case. It's sort of the default one. So, you know, you can't really say the genitive has such and such meanings. We want to say, yeah, prepositions have such and such meanings, and the genitive just follows them around. You know, we want to shift the perspective a bit. Now, uh, when it comes to other properties that we expect uh, to find, include, and analyze, which are really, really important, well, verbal morphosyntactic properties tie into prepositions. And here, when you look at the, the Croatian version of the famous Tommy's lexicalization pattern, the bottle floated into the cave, you can see, you know, the, the prefix and the case and the prepositions form sort of a argument construction or lexicalization pattern. Same with this, where you have from to hollow a pumpkin, uh, a very complex morphosemantically produced type of uh, verb with the prefix and the reflexive pronoun and the preposition and the case 
shifting the meaning to delve into something. I call this for preposition constructions in my analysis. And of course, on the level of sentence and discourse level structures, so something that's not necessarily directly tied to verbs, you still get prepositions, right? As discourse markers in non-modification. So you, you know, go outside of the sentence core and you can go into sentence periphery if you focus on them. Now, why database of Croatian prepositions? Well, the idea is simple, unify extant and novel data. And this is currently dispersed across uh, lexicographic sources, reference, grammars, case studies of selective prepositions, mostly from a cognitive linguistics perspective, which is quite useful, I have to say, when it comes to preposition semantics, valency dictionaries, but we don't have a framework. Now, this means that we cannot really try to replicate or evaluate um, you know, the methodology used by the only other real preposition database. As to my knowledge, that's the preposition project by Ken Lipkowski and Oren Hargraves, uh, focusing on English, where they use FrameNet as the source for the corpus examples, the annotations, and stuff like that. What we plan to do is basically use general corpora. We have three of them. Uh, do sample preposition uses, though this will not be the focus on my, of my talk. This will be, although the arrow should have been down here, I don't know. Uh, <laughs> identifying relevant metalinguistic data for annotation, especially I will focus on evaluating extant online and offline resources and focus on preposition semantics in particular. And here I will give a constructional perspective. Okay, so why preposition semantics? Why this can be a starting point? Of course, it's going to follow with the syntactic features, but I will talk mostly about the semantic uh, side here. Well, there are two questions in preposition research that have been very important throughout, you know, the 20th century and the 21st century. Uh, that's like how many senses what does one preposition have and how contextually dependent or independent they are. And there have been two answers proposed. One, very little. Senses are very way, vague, you know, context resolves everything. And the other one, there are many senses. Uh, some call this approach even radical polysemy, where basically for every new spatial temporal configuration, you propose another sense. And, you know, you can look at the Croatian now on and say, well, you know, this is all a Croatian proposition, meaning now with the locative on. And you can look at this and say, well, it's, you know, one sense and so forth. But if I translate these examples to you, you will see why, you know, the polysemy approach should not be the way. This would be man at the door, man at the window, standing at the window, window curtains and a portrait on the wall, right? So there is some logic behind, you know, the both approaches, and we kind of want to take maybe and explore a middle ground talking about constructional representations because we don't want to, you know, pause it for every use in other sense that will be also uneconomical in a database. Now, very briefly, we looked at different lexicographic sources, reference grammars. They differ in the number of senses. We can't just like use one or the other, you know, some posit two, some posit three, some posit ten. Uh, so we will consult them. We also looked at valency dictionaries. Now, this is one called a glava, where you can find some useful information, right? Like you can say, you know, when it's a prepositional complement, it's the object of attention in the sense. Adverbial is, you know, a place, but it has a limited verb inventory, psychological verbs, doesn't focus on preposition sense inventory, and omits basically sentence periphery discourse markers, like the broader, you know, things that go over a sentence, so to say. Croatian Dependency Tree Bank is another resource we were tempted to look into, equate sense inventory with semantic role labeling, so you have na as a theme and na as a location, right? But, you know, one problem is that when you look at this universal dependency approach, uh, it lacks actually, you know, semantic, fine grained semantics. So there's a semantic granularity problem. It doesn't really annotate secondary prepositions. So this would be a complex preposition with regards to, which basically is sort of represented the same as, you know, the na, be angry at. And because it is ex excludes complex prepositions and various non compositional language structures, actually, my colleagues working in such an approach have started to add multi word expressions. And I say, okay, you're going into construction territory now, right? Now, finally, there have been studies where you can equate what I said prepositional senses to constructional meanings. And uh, myself and others have been working on those. 
for some time now. Now, I will just focus on this example due to time limits. But if you look at Na with the accusative and everything I told you about so far, in one particular construction, the NPP construction, it has a naming function and it's productively used to produce things equated with compounds in uh, English, touch screen. Odd from codes material. So you can actually kind of mine for construction such as that as you're annotating census. Now, so far we have 36 sense candidates. I will, you know, in this discussion, I can say more about them, but our main idea is actually to use such senses as macro senses. And if we focus again on the manner sense, one of those which we kind of, you know, uh, extracted by looking at reference sources, extant resources and our own data, you can say, well, manner is a macro sense. We have na, on and is, out of as two um, prepositions, among others, that can be used in the manner sense. But only one of them, na, is used in the MPP with a naming function. So you have kind of the intersection of senses and, you know, um, uh, ways to actually annotate preposition semantics, but do it through contextual, clear limitations, restrictions, and productive patterns at the same time. And you have idioms which abound like everywhere. So we can go back to that in the discussion. So final slide, in conclusion, we want to look, uh, give a constructional perspective, look at prepositions as anchors of complex constructions. They're the carriers, like the ones that semi-lexically feel something, right? They are also uh, constructions themselves, secondary prepositions. So you can go into prepositions per se. And we see here a potential for a two-level approach to uh, semantic analysis of prepositions, where you look at preposition senses, at the same time looking at network of preposition construction senses. And here, it, it's not shown on the presentation, but I put inheritance links, which I think we can visualize and show and actually move um, into representing them as a constructive type of visualization for users at the end. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Now we have uh, have time for questions, so please uh, go ahead. Yes, get the please. Very interesting. Thank you. Uh, I'm wondering if the preposition uh, constructive term will then be integrated with a become natural constructive term. Well, uh, so here's the thing: there is another research group <laughs> that uh, I'm a part of, so I can maybe speak to that. Uh, I've, like uh, doing this. This, these studies, the I put this here actually. Let me see. I don't know what happened. I'm really sorry. The presentation was looking amazing when I sent it. Uh, so and it had all these animations. Let me see where it is. Um, so oh yeah, uh, this is the lexicalization patterns model. This is uh, the, the other research group that you know works in construction grammar more specifically. I want to say. Although I have to say that, you know, as a digital resource, we've been working in, we have been discussing this, and even I is online, I think, the Project BI uh, of the preposition database. So actually, you know, when we started working, we have been discussing about ways to kind of, you know, make this repository and then see what we can combine sort of through collaboration. So from different yeah, well, I mean, this is a maybe this is a proof of concept type of thing because we are getting deep into very specific questions. It's not, you know, the schematic meanings of a construction. When you get into preposition senses, you really like, you know, mining the very item specific constructions at the same time. So, you know, you can, I, I would definitely think that this is one way to go about it. You can start with preposition prepositions. You could say, of course, verbs would be the obvious candidate, right? But um, one doesn't necessarily exclude the other anyway. So, yeah. It's like yeah, yeah. But it'll be like separate database at the moment, yeah? Separate. No, this is a database the... dedicated to prepositions. Mm -hmm. Yeah. This mm -hmm. is a database dedicated and what's to what's the database format? What is it? XML or what? What is the format? Oh, no, the this is a work in progress. So our programmer uh, from my faculty, from the... Department of um, Informatology, as we would mm -hmm. call it, uh, is, um, you know, will fill the database. We it's still, mm -hmm. this is still the modeling part in the first three months. So we're talking about 
what uh, features can we predict need to be annotated and maybe leave the database open so you can have the pluses because you can basically build it yeah. two ways, right? You can have it like, just give me all the boxes. Mm -hmm. I put everything in Excel yeah. and then whoop, that's yeah. it. You okay. know, the front end, the base end, everything, the mm -hmm. design is done. And you can have the other way where you can edit it and, mm -hmm. you know, develop mm -hmm. it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. But do you also plan to have links to corpus since you use dependency trees already? So, so to keep this information so that uh, it will be possible to link with corpora. Oh, so we will. Uh, this is one thing we looked at the you know, the dependency visualizer for the Croatian dependency tree bank. There's basically like three versions of that. One has three thousand sentences. One nine. Uh, I think the third one six. I may be misremembering. Now what. Uh, we will probably link it to the corpora itself. Mm -hmm. So we are annotating uses and we're taking a corpus-based approach. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. One thing when you take like a corpus-driven approach and you go with engrams, and I tried doing that for my PhD in prepositions, mm -hmm. like, no, like it just, you get, I'm sorry to say, mm -hmm. you know, herpa in the sense of piles of unrelated mm -hmm. somethings. And then if the corpus is skewed towards, let's say, legal texts, mm -hmm. uh, then you're always going to get like, the most frequent and the PP phrase will be something like mm -hmm. in this article six of some legal, yeah. you know, documents. Mm -hmm. So not really constructions, which I think keep in mind, in my personal opinion, it's always the semantic. It's always the gestalt, right? Mm -hmm. It has to have this sort of idiomatic meaning at some level. It's not just mm -hmm. M grants. Mm -hmm. I wouldn't equate the two theoretically. Yeah. We also use like corpus-based approach, so it can be word-based or construction-based. It's like a, we will have this last paper about this, so you, you might get might get additional, you know, like information about yeah. it, so that if you just look only on the basis of uh, the schematic construction, let's say so. Yeah. But, uh, yeah. So. No, but this is yeah, this is definitely yes. a starting point. Then yeah. please. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, I have a question about these policy networks. Uh -huh. um, since I'm, a lot of the polysemies come from the uh, positions with a complete spatial meaning replying mm. to a bunch of abstract uh, senses. And there is some systematicity to, uh, let's say, metaphor and autonomy. Yes. And you do. So will you add that kind of dimension to the polysemy network? Yes, uh, it's just that we didn't have, I mean, here it's just a snippet of this not, right? Because it would be different. Yeah, yeah. yeah. But uh, these are sort of the senses, uh, this is uh, even now, uh, and I have been talking about this a lot. So this is the first sense that started sort of as a um, lexicon. And then these are, you can actually call them micro senses. And then we talked about last, just before this presentation, uh, like we should make decisions on how topologically specific you want to get in the subsenses, for instance, space and time. So mm -hmm. this, it just shows space here, <laughs> here somewhere, uh, space, right? But this is not the only sense. So this will have orientational, locational, um, dimensional, you know, codings like in, out of, into, like all of that, yeah. Mm -hmm. Is that some, I mean, most uh, preposition studies are on particular prepositions, case studies, so you wouldn't have chance to explore that systematicity that you have. So I'm, I'm very happy that you're taking care of that. Yeah. Well, hopefully, hopefully we'll yeah. see regularities. Yeah. All right. Uh, do we have any more questions from our lexicographers? Okay, then thank you very much. And um, so you can come and prepare if you have one minute for, for change. And it will be about using dictionary definitions to identify the semantic profile of an open slot in a construct. Hey, you know about the Merck mate, it's a People online, uh, can you hear us and everything is okay? Okay. Ah, yes, okay. <laughs> <laughs>
Sí, no, 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 The office uh, version is older in this computer, so uh, this does not uh, complete your, uh, your presentation. My needs. The local, yeah, yeah. yeah, we do, but uh, not the, this particular one. Yes, so uh, this is uh, um, uh, something that is connected more generally to uh, questions about uh, that arise when uh, compiling uh, a constructicon. So how to uh, identify the semantic profile of an open slot in a construction. So we are uh, proposing to use uh, dictionary defi definitions to extract um, uh, this uh, semantic profile of a, of a construction slot. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So, some uh, background, our uh, goal, and the expect and the, the the method we propose, and the expected benefits, um, a case study, uh, uh, more uh, and under case study. Uh, uh, analyzing a slot in a particular construction, the Estonian translative in creative construction, and, uh, uh, and the summary. So the properties of a schematic construction, like its uh, uh, meaning and productivity, uh, determine the class of elements that can appear in an open slot of the construction. So consequently, identifying the semantic profile of the class of words that can appear in a construction uh, would allow to identify the meaning of the construction, to identify the productivity of the construction. Uh, uh, also, possibly the historical development of the construction. And uh, it uh, could, uh, would allow to describe the meaning of the construction, for instance, in a constructive cographic resource or in a study. So there are uh, quite a lot of methods already for uh, analyzing a category of words uh, defined by a construction or a construction slot. For instance, uh, 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 the words can be uh, analyzed using a semantic inventory, for instance, uh, or, or a classic or a classification, for instance, uh, event types or verb classes, or also frame net frames uh, could be a basis for uh, grouping the words uh, into semantic uh, 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 categories. Uh, also, a lot of work has been done on categorization using semantic similarity measures uh, based on uh, uh, distribution, syntactic distribution, uh, like word embeddings, or semantic re uh, relations, for instance, extracted from WordNet. <laughs> and uh, uh, and uh, so using the similarity measures, words can be clustered using the cluster analysis or, uh, net, or for instance, uh, recently network science has been introduced as a method. 
Um, uh, it's also possible to cluster the words uh, based on the collocates uh, and covariant collections. Uh, and also uh, it is possible to uh, uh, identify the most strongly attracted associated words of a construction and then uh, categorize these uh, words. Uh, so uh, what we propose is to test or to um, or rather to propose uh, an, an idea and to start to explore an additional method uh, for describing the semantic profile of a construction slot uh, using semantic descriptors gleaned from dictionary definitions. So why come up with this idea or this method? Uh, first of all, uh, dictionary dictionaries and dictionary definitions are a very rich uh, resource. And uh, the idea, the basic idea is to find a way to, to make use of it, uh, to find ways to, to use this rich uh, data, data set. Uh, also, for instance, when comparing to categorizing words uh, intuitively, or um, it could be, it, it could give more objectivity. The definitions are constructed by different lexicographers at different times uh, independently. Uh, also, there may be, uh, again, when compa comparing to uh, uh, other uh, categorization methods, there could be aspects of meaning that are relevant to the meaning of a construction or, or the productivity of a construction, but that are not captured by semantic inventories um, or, uh, uh, or uh, the clustering uh, method based on distributional similarities or semantic relations. Uh, but such aspects of meaning could be gleaned from uh, dictionary definitions, which go beyond recording just the the, uh, the broad semantic type <clears throat> uh, or semantic relations of a of a lemma. Um, so there will will be some examples in in the case study. Um, so. Uh, a, uh, another uh, potential benefit compared to uh, pre-existing semantic uh, inventories could be that the method can be applied to any set of words defined by a construction, not only words belonging to a particular semantic category, like uh, like uh, events or, or a particular syntactic category like verbs. Uh, and uh, in comparison with uh, cluster analysis, uh, a, a benefit could be that the method can uh, provide the categories that emerge uh, from the analysis with semantic labels. In case of cluster analysis, the labels would have to be uh, invented, so to say. And in view of a constructive cographic resource, uh, it could allow to extract of the semantic definition of a construction uh, from the definitions of the words that occur in the construction by, uh, by gleaning these um, recurring uh, keywords or descriptions uh, in the definitions. And there is uh, previous work using uh, dictionary uh, definitions for the purpose of semantic classification. Uh, for instance, uh, dictionary definitions have been uh, used among other sources to refine uh, uh, verb net classification by annotating, uh, extracting uh, precisely such verb specific features that are not captured by uh, general categories. Uh, or general event types. Uh, also, uh, there is a, a model, uh, a module uh, that builds uh, concept graph definitions 
for words uh, by automatic processing of entries of large explanatory dictionaries. And these uh, resulting set of definitions in turn have been used uh, to measure uh, semantic similarity of words. Uh, but what we uh, intend to do is to not to establish a general ontology or uh, but uh, to characterize a particular a class of words defined by a particular construction or uh, by, by a particular construction slot. And so uh, we present a small case study, uh, a construction we call the Estonian Transl Translative Increative Construction, uh, consisting of uh, the verb uh, meaning go uh, in third person. Uh, and event now, it is an incredible construction, but it's in ma many ways uh, quite special and idiosyncratic. Instead of an infinitival, uh, the main uh, word uh, of, uh, of the construction is uh, a nominalization, an, an event noun, intransitive case form. Uh, the construction does not have a subject, but uh, the arguments can be realized as adjuncts. And it is also pragmatically specific. It's an expressive construction, uh, only occurs in colloquial register. So uh, an example, uh, uh, for example, Visla ja Levadia Fenni Devahel Lex Lermax. So literally between the fans of Visla and Levadia, two football clubs. Uh, went into a fight, meaning a fight broke, broke out between the fans of Miss Land Levadia. Um, uh, so uh, that there is no subject, but uh, the, the participants are uh, uh, realized as an adjunct. And now, and I will scroll. Okay, how much what time we, do I have for what presenting the actual method? Oh, okay. <laughs> no, we have all together, we have something like 20, uh, 12 minutes. Okay, so, okay, yeah. okay. Nice. So the method mm -hmm. consists of uh, three step, steps, I could say. So, first is then uh, a data extraction from corpus and making, uh, then performing color structure and analysis. Uh, to find out what is the type and token frequency of the nouns that occur in this particular construction, then calculating uh, constructional strengths. And this is uh, in order to line up uh, uh, the actual uh, slot fillers, the most uh, strongly attracted ones, and then the peripheral ones. Then the, the other uh, next step is then exploration of the dictionary definitions of those nouns, both the central ones and the peripheral ones. Uh, and uh, by this exploratory uh, phase, then uh, we established a set of uh, descriptors, bottom-up descriptors. And th then the actual... Uh, uh, profile of the category of the noun was then uh, compared in terms of relative prominence uh, of the, the uh, descript, uh, descriptors that are present in their dictionary definitions. So, okay, this one, yes. So we extracted uh, we made a, a, a subcorpus of uh, blogs and forums because this uh, construction is uh, mostly uh, present in a colloquial register. And we use sketch engine corpus query interface you know, in order to, to find out all those uh, cases of this cons particular construction. And here are the results of the data extraction. Um, uh, here are some indicators uh, of productivity as proposed by Bayern. So you see very high token frequency, um, high frequency 
it was then uh, more than 1,000, it means more than 1,000 different uh, uh, nouns could occur in, in the slot of, of the construction. And uh, actually, we, we, we had a closer look only on those uh, types that occurred more than uh, five times in, in our uh, data. And we, of those uh, five hundred, five and a half hundred, uh, then uh, forty-two percent uh, were present and as no known lemmas in, in Estonian composite. So here is actually then the distribution of the collocational strengths. Um, so you see a typical uh, uh, Cipian curve, almost a little bit different here, but uh, actually this is the set and the most strongly attracted uh, nouns. And here is the tail of the rest of the nouns. So, and here are then uh, 20 most strongly attracted uh, nouns. Um, we, we have colored, colored uh, those specific, uh, uh, those that seem to reveal a kind of specific uh, semantic uh, uh, meaning or, or fight, but there are also others. Um, There is an aspect of uh, productivity to those uh, uh, nouns that uh, quite a huge percentage of them were ad hoc derivations uh, from verbs that, that didn't occur as nouns in, in, uh, in the dictionary as keywords. So among the most central and uh, strongly attracted uh, no, so we could we could see uh, one third of them, but when we, we saw the 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 whole uh, uh, set of nouns that occurred more than five times, then there is uh, three three quarters uh, ad hoc uh, uh, derivations, which is interesting actually. <laughs> So, <laughs> we didn't do that. <laughs> this is a template of Estonian institutes, <laughs> just to give us. So, okay, there is for comparison the most. Uh, okay, we have only three minutes. I have to skip this then because we need to go to the, uh, then uh, the, the, the presenting the actual method of uh, finding the semantic descriptions. So we searched uh, in the definitions then for certain keywords pointing to either to conflict, quarrel, or collective involvement, intensity, and so on. We, we had some uh, preliminary ideas what could be the uh, central topics, but uh, all in all, um, it ended up uh, with a set of uh, 50 descriptors. And here is an example of, uh, well, again, then the, the top most strongly attracted words. So I have colored the words that were used as keywords, point uh, that were used then as the bottom level descriptors. Uh, you see here, yeah, step one is then uh, kind of generalizing of the uh, keywords in, with such meanings into uh, a descriptor label as intents or those were abstracted into such a d descriptor name. But then we, we found that we have to abstract even further uh, and to 
rather than uh, semantically related uh, low, lower order descriptors into uh, more higher order descriptors uh, so that the number of them wouldn't be too big. It's 17 in the end. So, so this is how we did uh, then the relative prominence analysis all the, the presence of the descriptors uh, was compared to the uh, presence of uh, the descriptor event, which was taken as the base level uh, to see the relative prominence. And we compared then these two sets, uh, the, the most uh, strongly attracted group against then the less strongly attracted group. And this is then actually the two, two profiles then mapped uh, on each other. So the, the most attracted nodes are, are uh, the yellow profile then event is when everything is compared to event. So as you see, the most strongly attracted uh, lemmas share the meaning of being physical, being collective, being intense, intensive, also uh, including confrontation, uh, being some, somewhat less being business related, uh, ob object directed. Uh, but the rest of the lemmas then didn't share those features so much, be not so physical, collective or intense anymore. But uh, the, um, they were a little bit more object directed then and more verbal and more emotional. And there were uh, categories that were, were not present in, in the most uh, strongly attracted group, uh, which were then decision making, uh, goal orientation oriented, or competitive situations. So how how I con uh, okay mm -hmm. no time for conclusion. <laughs> <laughs> okay, okay, okay. <laughs> okay. The construction analysis provided us with a list of lemmas occurring in the open slot of construction. Um, the, uh, the central members are, are the most strongly att attracted ones, um, and the long tail of lemmas reveals then the productivity of the construction. And we, we can conclude the semantic profile of words occurring in an open slot of construction can indeed be gleaned from the dictionary definitions. The results suggest that the transla translative inceptive construction primarily denotes the inception of intense collective and confrontational physical activities. This sem semantic profile is in accordance with the expressive and colloquial nature of the construction. The semantic profile of the less co attracted collection suggests the productivity of the construction and reveals the features inherited from the central group, like object directedness, intensive intensity, collectivity, and being verbal. Okay, I can skip this discussion. So thank you, you for attention. the discussion slide so uh, yes please questions yes, the end suggestion and a question so if you want to represent construction strength in a dictionary format and uh, you may want to look at the color profiles yeah yeah yeah, yeah. So mm -hmm. you know that we have discovered yes uh, uh -huh. but we haven't looked very closely i i just know that they do exist Yes. Mm -hmm. Well, they have an idea about how to do it. They're not going to do it yet. Mm -hmm. no. mm -hmm. Yes. And then the question uh, Have you encountered any, what they should call coercion phenomena? Like, I mean, if the same typical yeah. Yeah. Uh, verbs yeah. were about yeah. Yeah. You know, mm -hmm. conflict or conflict, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. if they, I mean, a different verb and that would get that kind of it. Yeah. 
construction. We did, yes, yes. Intuitively, yes, the construction gives this meaning of uh, dynamicity and uh, conflict, conflictuality. And how uh, it's been works. chaotic uh, somehow. And, and that's where these semantic profiles then get very nice because if you specify this is the meaning of the construction element, mm -hmm. that means that if you put something there, it doesn't need to have that meaning itself. It gets it by it the gets it yes. indeed. So, so that yeah, okay, good. And then do you also have some elements that doesn't get that meaning? Intuitively, they always do. Okay. It, but it would be good, of course, to make a, some sort of a, a psychological test to to verify this because yeah. so far so, it's our intuition. So I mean, if you would have some cases where it doesn't get that kind of meaning, that is mm. when you would want to propose some kind of construction of policy. I guess. Mm -hmm. We we can. Uh, this would be something to test. Yeah. 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 Whether it's always. Uh, I can show just. Maybe one word, uh, which is quite high. Uh, <laughs> uh, here you see this uh, uh, giving, uh, which, which uh, literally mean mean unmina means giving, but actually it means also a fight, a fight. In, in this construction, particularly, yeah yeah, 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 yeah. So this is just uh, one example of coercion, I think. Violent mm -hmm. yeah. construction. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so now let's have a break, and then let's get back here in twenty minutes, right? Mm -hmm. Thank you. So uh, we have something to do with them. Um, uh, discussion uh, in which is more important in language uh, acquisition, either the words or the constructions, or both. Uh, and um, okay, nothing happens. Yeah. Oh. Okay, so on um, uh, Zoom and not even a bit as okay. Oh. <laughs> okay. okay. So uh, our aim was to provide the description of young learners' lexical and grammatical inventory uh, used in their written work texts, and we wanted to see if there is any co correlation between the wealth of vocabulary and the amount of constructions. And then we also uh, wanted to compare uh, the children's uh, lexical and grammatical inventory to uh, to the Sunabeb's description of the A2 level of young learners' uh, language. And um, because this A2 level uh, would be the level these uh, children are expected to be. And uh, we also wanted to find out if there is any any uh, any difference in in the descriptions and letters that the uh, that the children wrote. So if there is any difference between the text types. Um, yep. Uh -huh. Yes, I don't know which way. It goes so our the children that one were monitored were nine to ten years old, and um, they were tested during the project professional Estonian speaking teacher in multi multilingual classroom, uh, and uh, they all had two tasks, two written tasks, uh, a description. We had fifteen of them, and a letter. We had sixteen of them. And uh, the texts of both tasks were then analyzed according to the number of different lexemes, uh, the types and number of constructions, and the correlation between the number of lexemes and the number of constructions. And then the results um, shall also be compared to the A A2 level in Sunaveb. Okay, let's see if it 
if I learn it. <laughs> and uh, so we had 15 descriptions. Descriptions were mostly the description of the children's rooms um, or some pictures. And letters were usually wrote, written to a friend, family member, even Santa Claus, <laughs> or it was uh, it could also be a story about the uh, summer vacation, but then sent us a letter to somebody. Okay. So, and our first results about vocabulary, what I got uh, in case of descriptions, uh, the average number of exams were 31, per one description, and the variation was quite big. There was a child who didn't write anything, and um, there was a text where uh, 32, uh, 33 different lexemes were found. And the density, that is the type and token ratio, was 1.8 in these descriptions. And the children's vocabulary is dominated by nouns. If you can see this red, Parts and uh, the number of adjectives was relatively small. Adjectives are uh, yellow, marked with yellow. And uh, the number of uh, verbs uh, could be quite different between children. So these results are actually very similar to those we got with the, uh, in the analysis of uh, spoken texts of same children. So in case of letters, the average number of lexemes, lexemes was somewhat higher. And uh, the variation was still quite big. And the type and token ratio was 1.6. Uh, so that is that uh, in case of letters, uh, the, the width of vocabulary is somewhat bigger. And uh, children used lesser adjectives than in descriptions. It's actually predictable. And they used more verbs than instead in descriptions. It's maybe because they, they wrote about their summer vacation and they described their activities and it's quite uh, expectable. So uh, when we started to compare their vocabulary with the A2 level vocabulary lists in Senaweb. We, we found some, some differences between two text types, like letters and descriptions. And, um, but in both, both types, um, the percentage of the A1 level vocabulary was, was quite high, over than 75%. There were some uh, lemmas uh, on a two level um, from five to eight percent, and some lemmas above a two level. And when looking at these these lexemes, actually the biggest part uh, was um, can be called like proper names, uh, different names. Uh, like um, toponyms, um, also names for brands or, or some, some kind of objects and so on. You can see here, Horvatia, Pepsi, Vurugeta, and so on. Another part was, so, were mostly nouns, very few verbs. But what was uh, the most interesting thing we wanted to know was that maybe children use some words which are above the A2 level and which are uh, frequently used by several children. So then we can say that we could say that uh, maybe there are some words missing on the A2 level description of vocabulary. But actually, it turned out that uh, not, not many such words, only maybe only three and uh, one verb which was frequent in letters was teritama to greet, uh, but it was used only by three children. 
and uh, also swimming suit the tricot was used by three children and and three that was used by two children so this uh, these words above the level a2 are very variable so we go to constructions uh, and um, uh, in constructions we uh, we analyzed the phrase level the clause level and then we also uh, looked what what types of uh, of uh, sentences the children used um when we talk about the types of sentences then um i must say that it was sometimes very hard to, to determine where the sentence begins and where it ends because they don't always use the capital letter in the beginning and full stop in the end so sometimes you just had to decide this is the sentence uh, but uh, when we come to phrase level, and then we uh, we looked at the phrase types, and also we looked at the different structures of, for example, if we look here the noun phrase, then we looked at the different structures because we we wanted to know how complicated the the children's and and how rich the the uh, the children's. Uh, uh, constructions were, uh, and uh, here you, uh, one can also see that um, that uh, the letters uh, are le in letters they have used different kinds of of uh, um, phrase structures than in description. So here we can see how many children use this kind of uh, structure, and uh, on next. Oh, okay. Uh, uh, slide, we can see uh, uh, now particular children, how many, uh, uh, how many phrase types and how many phrase structures they use. So we can see that it is also different in descriptions and in letters. And, uh, but in average, we can see that somewhat uh, the descriptions are more rich in language in, in phrases than letters uh, and yes uh, when we look at the average of the phrase types and structures then then we can also see that uh, the uh, the description has more phrase types and more phrase structures uh, whereas the letter has um, considerably less. Um, now, when we go to the types of sentences, uh, then hmm, unfortunately, one can't see what types of <laughs> sentences there are. It has it has disappeared somehow. <laughs> anyway, the um, uh, the blue ones are simple sentences. And then the uh, orange ones are uh, sentences with, uh, with um, uh, ooh, how do you say it? When it's not written, I don't know. Uh, when, when there are several, uh, uh, yeah, no, not complex sentences, but there, there are several uh, uh, same phrases used. So, Kordlaus, uh, so, who says to me Kordlaus? <laughs> yeah, it has. Yeah. Sorry. Coordination. 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 Coordination sentence. Okay. <laughs> and um, then we also have here uh, the uh, <laughs> is uh, the yellow uh, the yellow one is then uh, the uh, the which is um, coordinated language uh, sentence, and uh, then the grey one is the complex sentence. Okay, and uh, uh, when we look at the types of sentences uh, on average, uh, then we can see that uh, children mostly use uh, the simple sentences, uh, but, uh, and in letters, the simple sentences are more used. So, uh, uh, then 
in uh, descriptions, then the sentences with homogeneous parts, which was uh, <laughs> called Lausa, uh, it is considerably more used in uh, descriptions, which is very logical because uh, the children uh, name things that are in their rooms, for example. Uh, and uh, also compound sentences and complex sentences are more used. So the letters uh, seem to be more simple than the descriptions when, when we look at this uh, table. Now, uh, when we look at the clause structures, so again, we wanted to see how uh, complicated constructions uh, the children use. Uh, and uh, so here we can have, for example, for example, subject and verb, subject, verb, object, and so on. Uh, and uh, again, it is quite logical that in descriptions, they use a lot the adverbial verb subject, uh, uh, subject kind, of, uh, uh, kind of sentences, because this is very typical for descriptions. Uh, whereas in letters, uh, more the subject, verb, object, so the kind of typical Estonian sentence is used. But uh, what is different in all the other levels and in clause level, uh, so we can see that actually in clause structures, there is more variability and more different structures used by children in letter than in description. And here, again, we can see by children who used how many clause structures. And uh, we can uh, then we compared it with the Sunabeb. And uh, we can say that th these children uh, used all the, the, uh, the phrase types and structures that are uh, described in, in Sunabeb. So they were all present. Uh, and um, all clause structures as well. Uh, and um, again, uh, the amount of complexity was very different in different children. So uh, one children was very good, the other less good. And uh, so we can also say that not all of them were on the A2 level when we look at the separate children. And um, uh, they more use usually more uh, complex language in descriptions, but clause structures variability is higher in <clears throat> in letters. So, for the summary, we would say that um, yes, it was expected that uh, the amount of constructions and amount of uh, lexicon, lexical items were uh, connected. And this connection was even statistically significant. And, um, and if we think about letters and descriptions and uh, think uh, of um, or like better, better possibility to assess or measure children's language skills, uh, then we can't say that one type of text is better than another. If you want to, to get more different vocabulary, then uh, probably we'll use um, uh, uh, letters. But uh, if, you, uh, if you want a bigger amount of variability of constructions, then you would choose for descriptions. So, and in case of descriptions, it is not so so simple as Tina already said that uh, the differences between clause structures and other structures. So, and uh, about the vocabulary in general, we can say that um, children used mostly A1 level vocabulary and only about 5% of A2 level vocabulary and some, some exams above A2. But, but, and constructions were all uh, at A2 level, A1 and A2. But 
we don't know. We don't know about the normal, so-called normal distribution of uh, in, uh, inventory belonging to different language levels. So we don't know if we just ask a monolingual uh, adult to use, to write the text, for example, the, a description or a letter, maybe we got very similar distributions. Maybe we just don't have enough data at this point. And this was our first uh, point, data collection point right now. We uh, will have some more material in near future and uh, we can compare this data with spoken data from the same, very same children. But now actually we don't have what to say proper conclusions <laughs> and we are in the beginning of the road. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. One or two minutes for questions, please, or comments. Oh, I can. Yes, of course. And is there like uh, this uh, project? Uh, it's uh, Synavip. Uh, before we also were talking about Synavip. Synavip, it's like this user interface for Akinex, but uh, but really in Tina, it's actually teachers' tools in Synavip. To to be clear. Uh, we have a special resource called Teachers Teachers Tools, and it really has those vocabulary uh, lists for different several levels and grammar descriptions for several levels, just, just so that people understand that those are different resources, actually. And it's very great that you do this job because um, when we compile those vocabulary lists, you know that only ex experts only were involved for pre-A1 uh, for kindergarten children. Others... Uh, they were compiled on general language corpora, textbooks corpora, and uh, learner corpora as well, but it's not validated. So we need more research on this to validate this, those vocabulary lists as well. And the same with the grammar profile. But we are very glad, Riley mostly <laughs> is the author of this uh, grammar uh, competence description. We're very glad that it's, it's, uh, it's actually quite cool. For I think. <laughs> and, um, from the point of view of uh, lexicographic resource, we also think that this collaboration with second language acquisition researchers is very important for us because it gives us um, ground for uh, for construction so that we can actually, uh, in lexicographic resource, already say that this, this construction is, let's say, A1 or B1 uh, level, so, and, um, and also about vocabulary. So, so we should work together all the time. Thank you. I think that it's time to switch now to the next presenters. Thank you once again. So one more presentation and then <laughs> discussion. Yes. So get ready for discussion. Hold on a second. Maybe those people who just joined our workshop, um, mm -hmm. uh, uh, we had already a presentation about um, our new project in the Institute of the Estonian Language. It's about compiling Constructicon for Estonian. Okay. So our this is next uh, uh, presenters are also part of our project team, uh, Jelena Kalas and Hete Sakai, and they will present uh, uh, the title, The Case of Estonian Argument Structure Constructions Containing Intellectual Arguments. And this is a group work, but these two ladies are presenting. Okay. So we return once more to plans and or rather dreams concerning the Estonian Constructicon. And as was already mentioned by Geda in the first presentation, the first goal is to 
connect the representation of Lexem specific government patterns in the Can you hear us now? Okay, uh, sound is okay. And we are... Yes, we can hear very well. Good. Cool. Okay, now we need to speak to the vision. Oh, sorry. <laughs> no, this is the correct one. Is it? No, no. no. Oh, that's the... The slides is, from the beginning, is, yeah. Is, yeah. 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 Okay, great. Here we go. Sorry for this. Um, yes, uh, it would be um, more economic uh, rather than uh, uh, compile the government description for each group. We can uh, create an entry for an argument structure construction and then connect it with uh, different verbs. Uh, it could also give a more uh, systematic coverage, uh, making sure that all the verbs uh, occurring in a construction are really linked to the construction. Uh, it could also have pedagogical benefits, guiding learners through semantically and syntactically similar uh, words and also helping teachers to compile teaching materials that uh, support the acqu acquisition of uh, more meaningful patterns. Uh, and also it, uh, provide the possibility to provide, to describe productive combinations of uh, verbs and uh, argument patterns. Mm -hmm. uh, so we chose as our, as our first case study to develop uh, uh, a workflow and uh, and the description format, uh, the case of uh, the infinitival uh, arguments, um, which are uh, uh, a difficulty for learners because Estonian has a whole series of uh, infinitives, the main ones being uh, uh, the so-called ma and da infinitives, uh, uh, as uh, in, for instance, uh, <coughs> uh, she's learning to swim with 
more infinity stuff. Uh, and the art master Uyuta, she loves to swim with the infinity. Um, so yes, uh, uh, learners of course have difficulties in combining the right infinitives with the right verbs. Um, the current state uh, of the combined dictionary contains some descriptions uh, of uh, uh, infinitival arguments in the entries for certain verbs, and these can be extracted. The list of, the, of these verbs can be extracted in the editing uh, interface, but not in the user interface. Um, so what we want to do is to add entries for argument structure constructions, uh, connecting them to Lexem entries and to show full clausal patterns in Lexem entries in a way that was, well, uh, already was illustrated in the first uh, talk by Geda. Um, so the first step would be to develop uh, a workflow for, uh, for um, uh, identifying the constructions to be described. Um, for extracting corpus data for these constructions and for analyzing the data. Uh, and uh, we are still, uh, for, the, for these infinitival argument constructions, we're still in the middle of this process. Uh, but so far we started by extracting the verbs which uh, with uh, infinitival arguments from the combined dictionary we analyzed the causal patterns of these verbs and the semantic groupings of these verbs. And based on the uh, causal patterns we identified, we constructed queries to extract additional data from, uh, from uh, corpora to validate uh, the patterns and the, and the semantic groupings. And we could also rely on an ex existing study on uh, uh, the distribution, on a construction-based study on the distribution of uh, of the Estonian infinite of these two infinitives. Mm -hmm. uh, yes, we have uh, just uh, a few slides to illustrate that. The, the two infinitives are in complementary distribution, both semantically and syntactically. Although both these suffixes have a very similar etymological origin, both originate in lative or directional case forms of de-verbal nominalizing suffixes. Uh, only the ma infinitive still uh, has this uh, uh, original meaning whereas the da infinitive has completely lost it. And so uh, these are uh, kinds of uh, prototypes for the, do, for the two infinitives. The ma infinitive occurs with verbs uh, uh, denoting motion or some sort of change. Uh, and the infinitive uh, uh, often uh, denotes the goal or the purpose of this motion of or change, whereas da infinitive more typically occur with more stative verbs. And uh, also to illustrate the semantic complementarity, the, the two infinitives uh, participate in several oppositions. For instance, uh, my infinitive uh, typically occurs with causative verbs, whereas the da infinitive hardly ever does. Uh, also, both occur in aspectual constructions, but the my infinitive uh, occurs uh, with inquiative verbs, whereas the da infinitive uh, occurs with continuous or habitual verbs. Uh, they also uh, appear with different uh, model, model work verbs. Uh, my infinitive occurs with verbs meaning must, and the da infinitive with verbs meaning uh, can. Uh, and also the da infinitive is uh, special in that it, uh, is, it is the only one that can, that occurs in a series of passive constructions in the sense that it is uh, the object argument of the infinitive that is uh, controlled by 
uh, an argument of the main verb, as in Kleitsobibkanda, literally, the dress is suitable to wear, meaning the dress is suitable to be worn. Uh, so this, uh, in addition to this semantic uh, complementarity, there is also syntactic complementarity. The two infinitives uh, as uh, in, in argument function largely uh, appear in different uh, uh, clause types, uh, uh, with the exception of um, uh, of subject control uh, uh, constructions with um, an infinitable complement. Uh, this is available for both infinitives, but only my infinitives uh, appear as uh, complements uh, controlled by the main verb object. Uh, only da infinitives um, can be uh, appear as complements um, controlled by, the, uh, by an oblique argument of the main verb. And only the da infinitives can be subjects uh, which are either controlled or not by an oblique uh, constituent, constituent. And so putting together the semantic and syntactic complementarity, uh, so each uh, these, of these um, uh, syntactic patterns uh, with each of the infinitives occurs with uh, uh, semantically related main verbs or sets of semantically related main verbs and can be analyzed as uh, a potentially polysemous argument structure construction or maybe a set of uh, argument structure constructions. And to give uh, just uh, an example of uh, one pattern, this is da infinitival complements controlled by the main verb subject. And they occur in semantically with uh, semantically related sets of main verbs. And the largest group is verbs that could be described as denoting a mental disposition regarding uh, the action denoted by the infinitive. Uh, verbs like Mean, with meanings like want, intend, decide, realize, forget. Uh, another group which could be seen as related to the previous one is verbs uh, denoting an, an affective relation like uh, be afraid, be ashamed, uh, love. Um, the third group is ability verbs, which in fact could also be uh, related to the previous ones. Uh, it, they could be described as denoting a physical or cognitive disposition um, uh, towards the action. So these are verbs like be able and can. Uh, a further group is connotative verbs, which could be uh, again seen as one step further from uh, simply having a disposition, disposition towards an action, but uh, uh, acting on this disposition. These are verbs meaning try. And finally, there are a few speech acts, verbs, again, related to the previous groups in the sense that uh, uh, they uh, uh, communicate uh, this uh, disposition to an addressee, uh, verbs like promise and threaten. Um, uh, so this, uh, this uh, syntactic pattern, the infinitable complement controlled by the main verb subject, could be described as a, a single argument structure construction, which is polysemous with a series of related meaning, meanings or potentially as a series of uh, related constructions. Uh, this is uh, uh, something... Uh, <laughs> Still, uh, 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 we, we need more analysis to decide which is a better approach. But for now, we chose as an example the mental disposition uh, construction and uh, to think about what should be the information that should be contained in the entry, in the constructive entry for this uh, construction. Uh, uh, as already uh, 
uh, briefly shown uh, in the first presentation, we, we go in, in a bit more detail through these different parts of the entry, but uh, it will still be incomplete. Uh, so firstly, uh, the type of construction, uh, which could be an argument structure construction or clausal construction, maybe a better term, uh, as opposed, for instance, to phrasal constructions or uh, complex predicate constructions or morphological constructions. Uh, then uh, a name should be attributed to the construction, which is difficult for now. Uh, we call it a mental disposition construction. Uh, then the form of the construction, uh, uh, which would have to come in uh, in a user-friendly form and um, uh, also in a more formal form and for, for the user-friendly Form, we will probably use uh, what what we already use um, in uh, uh, in the in the combined dictionary uh, presently. So using interrogative pronouns mm -hmm. and the uh, meaning, the, uh, this description of the meaning. Uh, also, we would like to uh, provide a list of all the verbs uh, that can fill the slot of the main verb. Uh, 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 and link the, these um, verbs to the corresponding uh, uh, entries in the dictionary. Uh, also, we would like to provide the provisions Proficiency level of the construction, which in this case would be A1. This is the lowest level where the construction is used with any verb. Uh, we would also like to provide proficiency levels for verbs uh, construction combinations. For instance, uh, the verb meaning want appears in the construction in uh, A1 level, whereas uh, the verb meaning, uh, for instance, long only appears in B2, although the, the same verb uh, possibly appears earlier in the transitive construction, for instance. Uh, also, we, we would like to um, uh, provide some information about the frequency of the construction, like a frequency class. This is uh, currently done for uh, words in the combined dictionary, showing the fre frequency class of the words, although not shown in the user interface, I think. Uh, also, uh, the frequency or association strength of particular verb construction combinations. And, um, of course, uh, examples uh, uh, chosen by the lexicographer and also uh, a query for uh, uh, querying additional uh, corpus examples. And now Lena will, will talk about what are the sources that we can use to do this work and what are the methods. Yeah, uh, so to achieve all this uh, uh, dream so that we have um, the full uh, description of construction and uh, its syntactic structure and also efficiency level of the construction and frequency of the construction and so on and so on. So this is what we really think uh, should be in the database so that it would be uh, reusable for different purposes, not just to be lexicographic uh, database, but also database for exercise generations for uh, different kind of purposes. We need, of course, uh, uh, corpora first, uh, but um, as you see now, probably we are going to build this Estonian uh, constructicon based on uh, lexicographic data first. So our first step would be will be to restructure our lexicographic database to find all this grammatical information there and try to reorganize it. Uh, but um, further step, uh, if we will be dealing with constructions which are not yet described in our lexicographic resource, then of course we will try to use, for example, ProBank for Estonian and other, and analyze all possible existing studies uh, uh, on Estonian. So when we are talking about uh, corpus-based identification of constructions, uh, it looks like law now. I don't know how it happened, but uh, 
Okay, the first would be our main uh, source is Estonia National Corpus. Uh, and uh, now we are working in collaboration with the University of Tartu so that um, the whole Estonia National Corpus will be um, um, annotated. It will have a multi layer annotation. We will use this as an cast answer syntax tagger. And what will be the result? The result will be is that um, we will have uh, like uh, a lot of data, not only morphologically annotated, but also with dependency relations. And uh, as I said, we make now experiments uh, on this um, uh, syntactic annotation. So we believe that it gives much more opportunities for us to identify uh, argument structure constructions, phrasal constructions uh, automatically. So like now we live in the uh, era of uh, post-editing lexicography. Now post-editing constructicography probably also. <laughs> so we will extract it automatically and then post-edit it. And for identity identification, we use different approaches, really like word-based so that um, uh, it's like what Kerto is doing in her master degree um, uh, thesis so that she has a word-based approach. You just give a word, let's say, are uh, some to love, and then you see what kind of uh, arguments are there in the corpora for this particular verb. Uh, construction based approach that's what we did for this research on Manda infinitival constructions. We actually had the string, uh, and then uh, Katrin, our developer, she tried to, to find all constructions uh, which were there with, this, with those verbs, so, but it was construction based approach. And maybe in the future, also explorative um, identification, for example, we can uh, uh, try to use engrams. And as for the uh, no, different direction. And now as for proficiency level, this is of course completely different uh, world, but, um, but we have a lot of resources for this at the moment for Estonia, and we are doing quite good. We have uh, learner corpora and uh, in the Institute, we do a lot of work on getting more and more learner corpora. We have textual corpora. We have quite good tools for analyzing um, uh, learner data. So that uh, probably we have also researchers like uh, in Tallinn University so that uh, we can validate those descriptions of grammatical competence. So we hope that this data will come from uh, learner's corpora mostly so that we will be able also to say so that this particular construction is at this level. And open open question. <laughs> oh, actually, just one minute and then the yeah. general discussion will start. Okay, so, great, great. Uh, just, uh, would be nice to take some uh, questions, questions for from, this. from uh, uh, auditory. Yeah. Okay. Any questions or comments or otherwise they will ask the questions. <laughs> okay, please go ahead. Based on your research, can you give any tips to the teachers of Estonian as a second language, but not foreign? Language, so. Yes, this is the, I forgot to say, but this is the ultimate goal. So we have several goals to uh, to establish a workflow for describing constructions, then uh, uh, to establish the, the structure of the entry and what we, where we want to arrive with this case study is some uh, example materials for uh, L2 teachers or L2 learners. But this is where we are headed. <laughs> but so this is the goal. Yes. Okay. Let's take this question. Hello, or comment? Yeah. I, to start with a clarification question. Mm -hmm. So. You showed that nice, uh, very syntactic patterns. So, how do they interplay with the semantic categories of the matrix verb? Is it just so for, for the syntactic patterns where you can have both types? That's where the semantic class of, of the matrix verb matters, or how do they interact, syntax and semantic? Uh, they are almost completely complementary. There are hardly ever any verbs. There, there are a few verbs that can take both infinitives, but in this case, the meaning also changes. So they are. So the, the there is a form, and the form goes with a specific uh, meaning or groups of um, verb semantic. 
a group support. Uh, mm -hmm. Then, regarding the frequency of the constructions mm -hmm. that might go to yes, but uh, my guess would be that when you look at the this word plus construction, that's something you can get. Mm -hmm. yeah. uh, mm -hmm. if you get it, but do you have any idea how to get like the general frequency of these constructions when you don't have specify them to particular verbs? Um, uh, well, I think it's uh, it's possible with all verbs, for instance. So, uh, yeah, yeah. I think uh, yeah, or, or with um, because we will we're planning to extract uh, the data for a construction, and then maybe we can somehow extrapolate from uh, this uh, because the the goal is not a precise frequency, but for, for instance, the free categories system may be frequent, and not frequent in the in the middle. I think yeah, it's a challenge for full schematic construction. Mm -hmm. So this is really how to say how frequent is let's say mm -hmm. uh, adjective plus noun uh, phrasal uh, construction. This is difficult, mm -hmm. but if it's not uh, full schematic, but verb and uh, particular mm -hmm. like this one verb plus my infinitive mm -hmm. or verb plus the infinitive, then it's possible of course. Yeah, two very Okay, let's thank our presenters. Yeah. Now it's time for our general discussion. And so maybe for those who are sitting there back, maybe you can come closer here so it will be like more comfortable for us. Liam, you can you can talk that's a good sign. Okay, um So we have um, uh, something like 20 minutes and we have uh, four or uh, five questions. We thought that maybe one topic for five minutes, but actually if it will be, it will go in different direction and we will just, it, we will discuss just only one question. It's also perfectly fine. The most important is that we get uh, questions, answers to at least some questions, what we have here. Um, so the first uh, question of ours, uh, um, I was um, uh, this uh, nomenclature. No, yeah. So, which constructions should be included in the resource? Uh, but maybe we can make it narrow. And um, uh, the question would be which types of constructions are the most difficult to handle? <laughs> yes, Ben. <laughs> well, uh, when you look at the more idiosyncratic ones, Mm -hmm. You can look at them one at a time. That makes things easier. If you look at the general proposal stuff, you really have to build a coherent syntax on how you do clause and phrase formation mm -hmm. in that language. You can't just take like, this is all phrase construction, and this is also, I mean, you have to see how they fit together. Yeah. So then you're basically building a construction syntax and you can't do case studies of one construction at a time. I would guess that's the reason why so few have done a lot of work on the general syntax. Plus they believe it's already handled by phrase structure grammar, but it's not, it's more complex. Than so, I mean, if, if you wanna go there, it's because you wanna get a coherent syntax. If, if you want, I mean, getting entries where it's useful to look at one at a time to see that pattern, then uh, uh, I think it's too much trouble. But, but uh, um, yeah, I mean, I'm, I'm doing it because I want to do it. I want to build that syntax. But if you're looking for let's single entries, that that's then 
I don't think you would gain much from it. But then uh, what is the, when you say you're doing this, what is the starting point? How you start description? What, where it comes from? What is the starting point? Well, that, that's the thing. You need to look at it from several directions at the same time. You can't have one starting point and go, you have to look from this side and from that side. And, and you make hypotheses about how you think that the causal patterns would be like, and then you would fit them with argument structure and find out where it works and where it doesn't, and then you have to rework. So, so it's really building a system rather than particular construction descriptions. So either you want to do that, and yet then you have to be prepared to give that a lot of attention, or you leave it aside. Yeah, because from other side, we want our resource to be very practical and still pedagogically oriented in a way, do we? Yeah. Uh, yeah, so that uh, our idea is not to describe maybe the whole structural system and uh, a language in this way, right? But still, uh, so this your idea, when you say that what I'm doing, what are you doing? But, well, so... You just said that you try to describe language in completely new uh, way, well, right? We're, we're trying to do uh, an account, a constructional account of Swedish clausal syntax. Clausal syntax. So ba basically how you combine uh, um, smaller constructions in, into phrases and clauses and sentences. Uh, and, and that's really building a system rather than describing single constructions one at a time. Mm -hmm. Yeah, because we also were thinking about this here. Yes, so that, for example, we have this uh, argument uh, structure constructions, let's say so. Uh, and we saw that it could be presented in verbs, in verbs articles, so that for verbs. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But uh, then uh, if you have, we have the same components uh, from the point of view of other parts of speeches, like uh, nouns and adjectives. Yeah. Actually, those uh, components of argument structure construction, they are now presented as collocations. Yeah, yeah. yeah. But really- I mean, that you can do. I'm, I'm talking about how you fit the argument structure constructions with things like statements and questions and uh, cleft constructions. Mm. I mean, that that's when you have to build syntax rather than accounting for singular constructions. Mm -hmm. Okay, but um, in this case, if we'll just take it so, like, uh, so ambitious uh, to describe it, uh, maybe we can uh, uh, just, uh, leave this um, uh, second language uh, for a while and then go to data model uh, question. So how to fit all this constructional information into data model initially decided to present the lexical units. Maybe Arby, you can say some words. <laughs> yes, yeah, so our current idea is that we start from the corpus. So we, we don't start from the abstract construction, but we start from the re concrete realizations and annotate them as belonging to one or another type, and then uh, attach generalizations to those uh, realizations. And the realizations are basically headwords in a dictionary, including the very complex multi-word units, which may contain uh, constructions of constructions. Yeah. Um, so, so that's the current thinking, but uh, we are in such a starting phase that uh, I, I've been asking this question to content people all the time. Is it okay if we approach in this direction? And now it's uh, it's a perfect opportunity to compare it to other languages and, and see if perhaps anybody has practical experience that this doesn't work or... or, or well, if, if you ask any of the guys building a construct form from a framenet, they would say that's exactly how you should do it. Mm -hmm. I mean, framenet is an annotation-driven approach where you annotate actual instances and get the generalizations from there. So, so uh, uh, every time I talk to those guys, they wonder how I get from the annotations to the analysis and because they take it for granted that's how you should do it. Mm -hmm. So 
I, I guess you should talk to, let's say, Tiago Torrent or Alexander Zim or any who actually have this annotation approach to construct topography. And uh, it seems to be going well for them. Mm -hmm. But but you disagree? You, you wouldn't... I, I don't disagree. I just take a different approach. Mm -hmm. And and that's partially actually uh, inspired by uh, lexicography, I, I would say. Because we were working together with Swedish lexicographers and like looking at corpus data to arrive at uh, uh, a definition of the construction rather than annotating instances and, and getting the definition from there. So, so I guess uh, it's more a matter of that's the way we were used to work. So we but if you could, could, could I rephrase it in the way that uh, you do this annotation in your head in that case uh, when when writing that definition. You, you do the generalization or abstraction. I, I think the difference is that uh, if, uh, let's say, we're investigating a particular construction and we look for instances of that construction to, to get its properties, we don't do full text annotations of constructions in a text. We've done experiments with that and uh, it's uh, challenging. Yes, uh, perhaps I, I should uh, elaborate that. Yeah. I, I meant uh, annotations of multi-word units in the dictionary, yeah, yeah. But not uh, in the mm -hmm. text, so that uh, volume is more or less uh, doable. Challenging, yes. But yeah, yeah but so, so, I mean, uh, I don't know how challenging it is because I haven't done it. Uh -huh. So, yeah. so uh, but talk to the people who have done it and mm -hmm. uh, they could give you a better reply. Mm -hmm. And uh, like all of the framenet based constructicons are basically done that way. Mm -hmm. Yes, please. So. People online, can you hear us? No, sir. Come closer. <laughs> just can sit here near me. Uh, yes. No, no, the mic's on on the table here. Oh, yeah. So I just wanted yeah. to say that the so people who, they... who, are who, are who are online, you maybe you can turn your cameras on also so that we can see you and so you can join us <laughs> if you wish. <laughs> So our the data model of the Hungarian Constructicon is also is is just to their trust. So we are working on it. But the main idea is a construction is a dependency tree fragment. That's the point. Uh, we we will work it out in one or two years. And and what I wanted to say, I am searching for constructions which cannot fit. Because I think everything can everything is a dependency tree fragment. I think this is enough for us. But if you in the following years can can you show me constructions which cannot represent it as a dependency tree fragment then but if Mm -hmm. Okay. So, well, I'm not a specialist in this, but uh, is it like uh, the dependency trees? Do they have also this morphological information? I mean, about morphemes, about suffixes? Sure, of course. Uh, this touches on a different matter because, I mean, in computational linguistic, dependency grammars are the standard. Whereas in construction grammar, basically all of them are 
constituency based, not dependency based. I mean, you could translate between them, and I don't know how tricky that would be. But uh, uh, I've been waiting for someone to deal with that merger. If, if you do it, great. Mm -hmm. I mean, sometimes you can just translate between them, and sometimes you run into trouble. Um, so let's get back. Let's get back uh, to this question. So, how to fit construction information to data model? So, we are we did we get an answer or at least a clue how how we would answer this then? So that. Um, we have different approaches at the moment with Swedish, Swedish Constructicon, right? So that we go, what is our difference? Just to make it clear. So that you are looking for patterns and then you register them in the database, right? But, uh, but that, that's more of the methodology for how, how you yes. write mm -hmm. your analysis. Mm -hmm. I would say the main difference here is that how do you do if you don't have a lexical headword? Mm -hmm. I mean, that, that's the base for a lexical entry. You have a word. Mm -hmm. And uh, if you have something else, that's the thing that you really need to handle differently. Uh, otherwise, I think you could, with some effort, make them fit together quite. I mean, it's all about representing formal and functional properties of linguistic patterns. Mm -hmm. So you... you include the features that you think are necessary. And, and uh, so that's probably doable. You can incorporate the information you want mm -hmm. in the entry. But uh, what do you have instead of a head word? Mm -hmm. I, I think that, that's the crucial difference between the two data models. Other, otherwise, you can probably... I mean, the, the constructive con entries that we have are all inspired by and influenced by lexicography. Mm -hmm. so, so I don't think they look really that different if, if, if you look in the data structure. And it's related to the naming issue that you mentioned yes. in your keynote. And, uh, also naming and identification and yes, all and, of that. And access and all yeah. the user groups. It could be that the user group that wants that kind of access is very spe specialized and relatively Possibly. small. Possibly, yeah. That, that there might be a large user group that wants a dictionary-like approach. Mm -hmm. And then a small user group who wants a more specialized, more professional interface. Yeah, but um, that's that's what we think that uh, this our relational database has this huge advantage, so that you can actually have there all kind of information, and then you just present it in different aggregated in different uh, view, right? In different ways. In principle, yes. In principle, yes. So, so you're saying that essentially. The construction information is secondary and you can expand it from a lexical entry. So you don't re really need to access the construction entries directly. Yes, that's uh, for the large user group, or we haven't done any user research either. Mm -hmm. yeah. So we don't know how large is it. And uh, if, if we start from the assumption, which we like, by the way, that uh, constructicons will replace dictionaries, not augment them. Uh, then there will be a very large user group who doesn't care about the linguistic uh, technicalities at all. They, they want to know how to use these uh, words or sequences of words. They don't even know that they are constructions. And uh, in that case, the answer is yes for that user group. But we acknowledge that there might be a smaller or several smaller user groups that have completely different requirements. And for them, we currently don't have uh, a good idea about the user experience design. Yeah, and, and that might not be your main priority either. Mm. But uh, when you connect uh, syntactic constructions to lexical units, that works great where uh, let's say those constructions are typical realizations of those words. Mm -hmm. 
So you could you would yes. get the mass. Yes. But what you could not get is uh, how let's say how does this verb fit in into this structure when it's not common. I mean, when you see infrequent combinations of, of mm -hmm. words and constructions mm -hmm. that might be predicted from, from the properties of the construction, but they wouldn't be associated with the word because the word is not that common in that construction, mm -hmm. that would be harder to get. But uh, And I mean, distinguishing between uh, things that are impossible and things that are extremely rare. Yeah, I'm, I mean, that that's a common question you get from L2. Mm -hmm. Can I say this? Mm -hmm. Yes. And and that would work nicely if it's uh, common, but if it's not frequent enough to enter the lexical entry, even if it's licensed by some more productive pattern. Uh, I mean, it, I mean, you couldn't get that from a dictionary now anyway, I guess. So, yeah. I mean, it, it's still yeah. an impro but improvement. You could get it from a corpus current system. Yes. And if you make the dictionary comprehensive enough, uh, so that yeah. all of the corpus would be included, or at least somehow accessible. Yes, so you, you would get more, but you would never get everything. <laughs> but of well, course, we can never do that yeah, anyway. Everything that has been documented so far, let's say. Yeah, uh, yeah. Uh, like uh, a button, show more, show more, show more. You you keep pressing show more until you get your hotbox stuff. And yeah, stuff. and but there's still stuff that's possible that you wouldn't find in that the corpus you have. Uh, yes, and there is probably stuff that has never been uttered. Uh, yeah, that, yeah, that is possible, but 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 nobody has said it ever. Yeah. Uh, and, um, and there, there is no technical method of this, of singling that out from the impossible. Well, that's what the generative grammarians are doing yeah, all the yeah, time. Yeah, 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 yeah right. <laughs> uh, I mean, it, in principle, if if you see that something fits a pattern, even if it's not attested, mm -hmm. that's kind of a, a an okay sign. Yes, but, but yeah, but, but in any case, this is a, a, a an interesting question, but unrelated to the data model, because uh, right, whichever direction you're looking at, uh, the, yeah. the comprehensiveness of documentation is still an issue. Yeah, I mean, you can never get all the way, so mm -hmm. getting yeah. further is what we're always aiming for. Yep. Yeah. Okay, so we, we still need to discuss it, but maybe a last question, since we are now talking about corpora and constructicon, you said uh, that um, uh, we uh, really envisage so that uh, our constructicon and corpora will be closely connected through those corpus query systems, uh, corpus query in those um, uh, sequels, I mean, but, um, but you said that you don't have it, so what we should uh, take into consideration um, Maybe you have some ideas, suggestions, uh, so that it would be possible to design this uh, uh, database so that we would have this access to corpus data for each construction. Yeah. Um, are you saying you want links from the examples yeah, exactly. in the construction entry exactly. yes. to, to the to the corpus? I mean, if you have unique identifiers for each sentence in the corpus, then. We, we don't. Get that. Uh, that, that's a, a new idea for us. Uh, I, I, I got the idea from your keynote, and uh, we don't have those IDs, and uh, I can't see how we could have them because uh, a, a new corpus version comes out every two years, and we want to make it more frequent. And how to how to keep the IDs persistent? So, I don't know. So you can refer by corpus version. Uh, yes, yeah. th that's okay. So you need uh, uh, okay, yes, uh, but uh, then a user, an end user, would get uh, a mixture of examples from different corpora. Is that what you mean, or different versions of the same corpora? Corpus. Would that be a problem? Probably not. Yeah. Not, not, not easy, but. Uh, 
Actually, actually, we are dreaming about so that since, for example, we have the same database, but we have uh, different views for, let's say, uh, native speakers and learners. And then uh, for the same construction, we would like to have uh, the corpora access to different types of corpora. So learners mm -hmm. would get to the textbooks corpora, let's say, and native speakers would get to various kinds of corpora. Uh, web corpora, literature corpora, and so on. It's like in, in German, you know, the Soviet system, so that you have one uh, search and then you get uh, con con concordances from different types of corpora. This is what we are like dreaming about. Uh, but for this, but for this, you need to have this query in the database so that it would be possible. Yes, well, th these are two different solutions. Like okay. uh, Ben is talking about ID based links and you're talking about query based links mm -hmm. like, uh, asking the corpus for patterns like yeah. this yeah which, this, which, which means that the corpus needs mm -hmm. to be suitably annotated yes yes yeah and uh, also a new idea was uh, during this conference you were talking about this uh, constructional parsing uh, so I don't know what they mean by this <laughs> yeah I mean basically uh something that can identify instances of a particular construction in a corpus that, i mean that that's what you you're talking about mm -hmm. yes and uh yeah. that's easier for some constructions than for others uh i i would guess that Disambiguation between formally similar constructions with different meanings would be the trickiest part. But possibly you could, let's say, this is an instance of one of these three constructions and then leave it to the user to see which one is best fit. You could probably narrow down the choice quite a bit. Mm -hmm. But but then uh, mm -hmm. the, the finer... The more you get into semantic nuances, the, yeah. the harder it, it gets for the uh, whatever parse you're using. The more we talk, it seems unrealistic. <laughs> this is Estonian constructicon. <laughs> but uh, at least we can build it on the data what we have at the moment. This, this needs to be restructured anyway. Well, okay, I just was told that we have to go for closing. And thank you for those, those who were online with us. And uh, last slide. Um, it's not moving anymore. This one. So next steps. We uh, this since our project, it, it, we have four more years uh, in front of us, and also Hungarian lexicon, and you also, right? Uh, mm -hmm. Yeah. So we we thought that we might have uh, next workshop in a year. So we'll see how far we will get by this time. <laughs> so we will, and uh, maybe last next year we were thinking about having a seminar, maybe online seminar on constructional analysis with Anatoly Stefanovich. He said that he would be very glad uh, to teach. Um, so that this construction analysis, it seems also now very uh, not more not modern, but uh, the the approach which is everywhere and everybody is using it. So so that uh, we will, we would get uh, into this as well. But those are our next steps. It's absolutely the right person to invite for that. Yes. Uh, we, we, we just we will think about it the next year. Yeah. But he said he would be glad to organize it as this construction analysis. Uh, thank you for coming again. Uh, we think that we got a lot of ideas. Yes. <laughs> we are very grateful can... for, for every, every presenter and our audience. Mm -hmm. Listening to us and yes. being just present <laughs> yes. while we are struggling. <laughs> <laughs> we are all struggling as well. So like... Thank you for a very nice workshop. It's really great to meet and have right. several presentations on related topics okay. like this. Yeah, yeah. So that maybe we make it. We can make a picture and then go for closing. <laughs> if you don't mind. Photography. <laughs> <laughs> I should be in the back. Yes. People online. Thank you. And I'm um, connection now. Yes. Thank you. Thank you very much. Bye bye. Bye bye. Thank you. Thank you. Thank <laughs> you. <laughs>